I think thank you for joining us today, uh, the SEG Lecture Symposium. The SEG lectures are globally recognized individuals that serve as ambassadors for the Society of Economic Geologists and who are excellent speakers who are selected each year based on their significant contribution to the field of economic geology. The SEG Distinguished Lecturer and Traveling Lecturer programs provide support for the lecturers to present in person to SEG student chapters, universities, as well as in the city event all around the world. This symposium will continue that mission in virtual form, and today we are excited to host the SEG 2022 lecturers for a series of great presentations and discussions. Next slide, please. I'm Halelu Ekanjo. I'm a PhD researcher with ICREG at University College Dublin in Ireland. I, I'll be moderating the session. Next slide, please. Um, to kick start this event, there will be a brief introduction to the lecturer program by Mike Fenter, followed by talks from Hadid Fremo and Keiko Hattori. We'll then take a short break before resuming with comments from SED President Chico Abezedo. This will be followed by the talks from Elizabeth Howley and Caroline Perry before wrapping up with a forward-looking message from the SED President-elect Stuart Simmons. I will now hand over to Mike Fenta, the SED Vice President for Regional Affairs, to further welcome you to the lecture symposium and share some updates about the program and introduce our speakers for today. Mike, over to you. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of those who are joining us from around the world um, to um, for a very important um, SEG lecture symposium, which uh, is bringing together four really good quality speakers um, in the fields of economic geology for this evening. My name is Mike Fenter. Um, I'm the SEG Vice President for Regional Affairs, so I thought I'd um, just go through a quick few snapshots of what the SEG is all about. At a glance, um, the society was founded in 1920. Um, we have about 6,000 members, which is spread between academia, students, as well as industry. And these all stem from about 100 countries globally. Um, importantly, of these, we have 105 student chapters in 31 countries. Um, and we've also provided about $300,000 of funding to financial support for students uh, in the industry. And then coupled with that, um, we funded field trips, courses and webinars and virtual offerings to students as well as professionals. Um, and I think just as intro tonight, I'd like to focus on our student chapters as well as our student um, grant funding that the SEG provides. As I said earlier, we have 105 student chapters in 31 countries, which is amazing. Um, and obviously, our student chapters follow the broad objectives of the SEG, which is advancing the study of mineral deposits, applying that to exploration, evaluation, production, and dissemination of our what we've learned through meetings, field trips, and publications. Um, and I think the student chapters are an important link between graduating from university and then moving on to the professional industry or academia, as well as government. Um, and the SEG totally supports our SEG's chapters through funding from the Stuart R. Wallace Fund, which disperses approximately 75,000 US dollars to all the chapters on an annual basis. Just getting on to our student research grants. Um, there are several funds, as you can see. Um, generally, the grants are valid for one year and range from 1,000 to up to $5,000 in grant. And the grants generally support students who are working towards their master's or their PhD degrees in economic geology. As I said, there's several funds, many of which are geographically focused. Um, and an important note here is that the deadline for funding applications is in February, 15th of February, 2023. So I, I uh, encourage you all to go and check out the website and look for what specific funding. And just to mention that SEG student members will be given preference. Right, on to tonight's or today's or this morning's presentations. We have a great lineup here of four highly qualified geoscientists. Um, they've all made significant contributes, contributions to the field of economic geology. Um, these lecturers are selected annually by the SEG by through a series of committees. And um, the SEG obviously supports their participation in events such as this. 
as well as supporting student chapter events. And essentially, these people are ambassadors for the SEG. So moving on to our first talk, um, and I'll let um, Hallelujah provide more information on each individual talker. But first up is Hartwig Frimmel, who um, also is, uh, I have a good connection with Hartwig as he taught me uh, first year or second year metamorphic petrology down in the University of Cape Town. So he's talking about the global goal cycle. How did it start? And this will be followed by Kiko Hattori, who will be talking about magmatism linked to the formation of high-grade epithermal gold vein deposits. This will be followed by Elizabeth Holly, who will be talking importantly, and this forms a main theme of our conference in 2023 in London, is Responsible Critical Minerals, Transforming Mining for the Energy Transition. And then finally, and but certainly not last but not least, will be Caroline Perring from Australia, BHP, who will be talking about a new genetic model for BIF hosted martite girthite ores of the Hammersley province. So thank you for your time and enjoy the talks. Great, thanks Mike for that um, welcoming remarks. We are excited to introduce our very speaker for the day, Hartwig Fremo, the SG 2022 Thea Lindsley Visiting Lecturer. Hartwig is a professor and chair of geodynamics and geomaterial research at the University of Wusenberg, Germany. He is also associated with the University of Cape Town in South Africa, where he had previously climbed the academic ladder from lecturer to associate professor. Hartwig has worn many hats over the years, such as a leader of the Earth Science sub-program within the South African National Antarctical Program, as well as a member of the Geoscience Scientific Standing Committee on the Antarctic Research. He is a former president of the Society for Geology Applied to Mineral Deposits in Short SGA, as well as a director of Lithoscope Consultancy. He has served on several editorial boards, including Mineralia Depositor for the past 23 years, and also on the International Commission on Stratigraphy. Hartwig is an assessor for numerous national research funding and government agencies. He as well consults for mining and ore exploration companies and government bodies. His research interests developed over more than three decades from metamorphic geology and food rock in interaction to, to metallogenesis and economic geology. Next slide, please. Hartwig's talk will provide an understanding on how the global gold cycle started. Hartwig, welcome, and the next uh, few minutes are yours. Please take us away. Yeah, welcome everybody, wherever you are in whatever time zone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here in this round today. And now let's see what I can get my slide sharing going. Um, just a second. So, uh, why is it not working? That's a bit strange. All right. Can you see the title slide? Looks great. Good. Well, as, thanks, hallelujah, for the for the kind introduction. And uh, yeah, it's all about gold tonight, as far as my talk is concerned. Uh, especially, I would like to talk about how the very first economic concentration of gold to to a proper deposit scale happened in Earth's history. Um, we'll hear later today, or maybe for some tomorrow morning, um, what. What's all about critical metals, because uh, that's the flavor of demand, so to speak. And uh, for many of you, this might seem far more important to speak about um, critical raw materials, strategic metals, and that like. Um, so why bother about gold? Um, for a very simple reason. From a purely economic point of view, we are still spending more than 50% of our exploration budgets on the search for new gold deposits. So the interest in gold hasn't waned at all over the last decades, centuries or millennia. Um, the question is, which processes lead to the concentration of gold to all grade? Uh, in other words, how do we get from a background concentration of say 1.5 PPB uh, to a proper gold deposit? And uh, as Probably most, if not all of you might remember from your undergraduate classes in economic geology, 
this can be a very confusing story because there's so many different deposit types, gold deposit types, that at least for an undergraduate student can be, as I said, very confusing. Um, I don't want to go into the details of all of these deposit types that would be not possible within 45 minutes, but luckily for us, that effectively from an economic point of view, only very few um, settings that really play an important role. It's essentially, there are only three of them. There is, on the one hand, the uh, with Walter's rent type, and let's see what I can get my pointer uh, uh, a little bit bigger so that you can see this better. Okay, so one of them is the with Walter's rent type, uh, conglomerate hosted gold named after the type area in South Africa, which contributed some 30% of all the gold that we know of uh, in the Earth's crust, um, be it uh, from historic mining or from known reserves and resources. A similar contribution comes from the famous orogenic type uh, deposits. And uh, if you link porphyry and epithermals together, I think we all agree that this is basically one big mineralizing system, then uh, that accounts for some 28%. So effectively, these three settings they are the by far most important ones uh, as far as uh, total amount of gold is concerned. And for that reason, I will simply try to, to confine, confine my discussion to these three. Um, also something that we learn in undergraduate classes, endogenous gold deposits, uh, be it porphyries, epithermals, orogenic type, uh, intrusion related and so on. Um, they form typically above subduction zones. So the process of subduction seems to be absolutely essential for the formation of most of the endogenous gold deposits. So gold deposits that are derived from processes from within our planet. Um, so if you want to talk about what's the beginning of the gold story, what's the beginning of the gold cycle, then we are tempted to look for the oldest of these endogenous gold deposits. And we can ask the question, well, what's the oldest porphyry? What's the oldest epithermal? What's the oldest intrusion-related gold deposit? And in the search for this, I came to the Cote deposit in the Abitibi Greenstone Belt, uh, which seems to fulfill all the necessary criteria and has an age of 2.74 billion years. Now that's a number I would like you to remember for the rest of this talk, 2.74 billion years. Um, similarly, we can look at the age of the oldest orogenic type gold deposit. Now that's a famous story. The name orogenic says it all. It has been coined by David Groves, Rich Goldford many, many years ago in order to highlight this overlap in the temporal distribution of orogenic gold formation and um, supercontinent formation times of intense orogenic activity. Now, for us of interest is what's the beginning? And the first peak, here is gray bars, the first peak in orogenic gold is, as we all know, somewhere sort of around 2.6, 2.7, 2.75 billion years. Okay, there are very few exceptions that are older, but they are so minute that I will just leave them aside for the time being. So effectively, the first large scale orogenic gold production uh, kicks in at about 2.75 billion years. That raises another question. Why only 2.75? Why don't we find large porphyry epithermal uh, orogenic type gold deposits prior to 2.75 billion years? And intuitively, the, the first answer that will come up to mind is, of course, well, there's so few Paleoarchean, uh, Mesoarchean rocks around in the world, the chances of preserving these old deposits is so slim, it's just a lack of preservation that explains this lack of very old endogenous gold deposits. But I think there's a little bit more to that story. I, I think there's another reason. And this probably has something to do with the fertility of the subcontinental lithospheric mantle in these very early days of Earth's history. Which takes us to this, to this whole debate on, well, when did subduction start? Because remember, we need subduction zones in order to find these ore deposits. So when did subduction kick in? Um, the timing of the beginning of kind of plate tectonic processes, that's a crucial question here. Um, another aspect is, of course, 
um, maybe there wasn't simply enough gold in the crust to be cycled into the subcontinental lithospheric mantle at the very beginning to produce these kinds of ore deposits. And the third issue is, of course, the issue of the redox state of the mantle in the Archean. Now, if we search for the um, beginning of plate tectonics, um, Mike Fenter just told you that I taught him many, many years ago something in metamorphic petrology. And uh, he would probably have to listen to stories about, well, what's the evidence of subduction? And everyone, everyone uh, who learns about metamorphic geology also learns about paired metamorphic belts as being one of the key pieces of evidence for, um, uh, for subduction. The oldest paired metamorphic belts recorded in this world are in the Barberton Greenstone Belt, and they have an age of about 3.2 billion years. So that's one indication. Um, another indication for the onset of plate tectonics, uh, in my mind, a very important um, um, study published quite a number of years ago by the two Steves, Shirey and Richardson, um, who looked at the lithologic association of diamonds. And uh, they found that diamonds that uh, are older than 3.2 billion years they tend to be peridotitic, whereas those younger than 3 billion years, they are eclogitic. Now that clearly tells us something about the pressure regime in the upper mantle, and um, in turn might tell us something about, well, around 3 billion years, there was probably this, this transition from uh, uh, vertical tectonics to horizontal tectonics, in other words, beginning of a kind of subduction. But let's face it, the early subduction processes that probably looked quite different to, to today's subduction processes. The subduction zones might have been flatter, although that's controversial. Um, they were definitely hotter. So we had far more slab melting than slab dehydration at that time. And um, in this earlier hotter planet, the early subduction zones were probably much faster than today. In other words, also the spreading rates were probably much faster. Uh, and possibly they were not as oxidizing for the subcontinental lithospheric mantle as it is uh, the case today. So those, well, I think we will learn far more and uh, much better, get much better information on this from the following talks. But um, if you look at porphyries and epithermals, well, we have known for a long time that in order to produce these type of deposits, we need fertilization of the subcontinental lithospheric mantle. And how we do this? We do this by oxidation. What kind of agents do we have in order to achieve, achieve this oxidation? Well, H2O, CO2 would be a possibility, but not in the Archean, because I just mentioned uh, spreading rates, subduction rates would have been much faster. So there was far less time for this young oceanic crust to be hydrated. Ion 3 plus, well, it's not really an option because we are far uh, prior to the great oxidation event. So that's not, that's, that wasn't readily available in the Archean, which leaves us with the oxidized species of sulfur. And interestingly, as far as sulfur species are concerned, we have sort of a time window from about 3.4 to 2.75 billion years in which H2S was a very important uh, agent, but not the oxidized sulfur species. So in summary, it seems that prior to 2.75 billion years, we simply didn't have the right conditions for fertilizing the subcontinental lithospheric mantle. Now, also for, uh, good so far, but this raises a huge problem because we still have these Witwatersrand rent deposits, 90,000 tons of gold, roughly estimated. And this Witwatersrand rent gold, and I will try to convince you of this in the next couple of minutes, is primarily detrital the gold. These are placer deposits. They are 2.9 billion years old. So they are older than our oldest porphyries or orogenic type gold deposits. And this of course raises the question, well, where did all this gold, where did these 90,000 tons of gold come from? Uh, we don't have a source that is uh, of the right age. And even if you did have 
orogenic type gold deposits. And there are a few exceptions. Yeah, I'm 3.1 billion years old in the Barberton, but they are so little. And to explain the huge amount of quartz and gold, we would need um, proper gold deposits, gold bearing quartz veins, pr pretty much every couple of meters across the entire land surface. Uh, so from a simple mass balance point of view, that doesn't work. And that's, of course, the big challenge for explaining the genesis of the Witwatersrand gold, because if we subscribe to a plaster model, we don't really have a proper source. Now, as far as uh, the genesis of the Witwatersrand gold is concerned, that's, of course, a very famous story. Um, and uh, believe me, um, I think anything that the wildest geofantasy can uh, dream up has been suggested at some stage or the other to explain the Witwatersrand and gold. I don't want to go into these details. I just want to um, emphasize that at least for the last couple of decades, there were two models that were competing against each other. Essentially the epigenetic hydrothermal model or various variations of that model. And on the other hand, a syngenetic paleoplasma model with a little bit of post depositional remobilization, hence the term modified paleoplasma model. And the evidence for this, uh, well, you can't blame either side for, for claiming that their model is correct. Because if you look down a microscope, as you do here on the left, uh, on top left uh, image, you see uh, rounded pyrite and you see a nice uh, post depositional hydrothermal pyrite cube. And the gold is sitting here as inclusion in this pyrite. So, of course, everybody who looks at this uh, kind of image will immediately draw the conclusion that this gold has to be hydrothermal, that it's late in the parogenetic sequence. Uh, but bear in mind, what you see here is it doesn't tell you anything about the distance over which this gold has traveled. It could have this, it could have traveled by a few millimeters or by hundreds of kilometers. The other image, a very famous specimen, um, cross bedded heavy mineral concentration. Uh, defining this very delicate four sets in the bottom set at the base of a nice conglomerate. Um, now, of course, these kind of sedimentary structures are defined by heavy minerals. That's the case here as well. The special case here is that what you see as heavy minerals is largely gold. So all these particles here are gold. And this kind of uh, sedimentological control, of course, uh, speaks for a plaza origin. Now, the uninitiated amongst you, just a few words where this Witwatersrand basin is. It is sitting in the middle of the Carpal Craton in South Africa. Um, the basin is filled with sediments of the West Rand group shown here in brown and the Central Rand group shown here in yellow and almost all the gold is restricted to the Central Rand group. So that's the one that is of interest to us. Um, <clears throat> what sometimes is forgotten in the discussion and sometimes very, very hectic discussion on the genesis of the Witz gold, um, the geological basics and so forgive me if I repeat here some information that goes back, well, decades of, well, more than 100 years of mining that revealed that information. But the first observation, first order observation is the gold is strictly stratibound and stratiform. It's bound to conglomerates. Uh, take, for instance, one of the richest reefs. It's mined out by now, but in the past, it was one of the richest reefs, the main reef, running at more than 40 grams per ton of gold over a strike length of 40 kilometers. Uh, that's a bit difficult to explain by infiltrating post-depositional hydrothermal fluids. The miners have utilized and known for more than 100 years that there's a very strong correlation of gold grade with sedimentary facets, uh, especially with river channel fills and pebble lags and erosion surfaces. This strong sedimentary sedimentological control on the gold also come, becomes evident in this image here. Just a hand specimen illustrating a conglomerate. In this case, our ore body is just a few centimeters thick, but the ore grade in the conglomerate, gold grade, a couple of grams or tens of grams per ton typically. And then along the context to the hanging wall and the foot wall, which consists of quartz aeronetic uh, material, pretty much like the matrix of the conglomerate, but there are orders of magnitude lower gold concentrations in the football and the hanging wall. So very strict uh, stratigraphic sedimentological control. Um, on a large scale, the gold fields, they're all um, 
confined to the margin of the central Rhine basin, shown here in yellow. There's very little gold in the center of the basin because those areas are the deeper parts of the basin. So we only find the gold at the, at the margin of the original basin at entry points of former river systems into that uh, basin, which actually was a full land basin. Um, okay, I apologize for this slide because you won't be able to read much on it, but that's okay, that doesn't matter. All I want to show here is that in the various gold fields, uh, eight of them around, um, if you look at the gold bearing reefs, mostly these red uh, units in these stratigraphic columns, we can correlate most of these reefs over the entire basin, over distances of more than 300 kilometers. Again, that's something difficult to reconcile with a epigenetic uh, post-depositional introduction of gold. Well, if you want to have uh, epigenetic models like orogenic type gold, then you're looking for cross-cutting features like these quartz veins. Interesting, in the Witwoters Rand, these kind of quartz veins are typically barren or have a very low gold tenor. Uh, whereas the conglomerates, those are the rich gold ore bodies. So what happens here is that these quartz veins, well, along these quartz veins, we disperse the gold that had already existed in the conglomerates into locally into these quartz veins, but we don't introduce new gold through this quartz vein into the overall system. So effectively, we have no evidence for large scale post depositional feeder channels that brought gold into the basin. Another aspect is the structure. Um, is there structural control on the distribution of the gold? Well, locally, yes. But if you look at the and over the entire basin, there are completely different structures, largely to, due to extension, locally also thrusting. Um, but the structural uh, history in the different gold fields in the different parts of the basin is different everywhere. And yet, we find the same style of gold mineralization around uh, the margin of the central rent basin. So effectively, there is no structural control on the distribution of the gold on a large scale. Um, and then there's this famous old story um, of the micro nuggets. Well, um, I'm referring here now to a, to a little study by my colleague, Laurie Minter in Cape Town in the early 90s. Uh, he took this famous sample apart, separated um, the gold particles, looked them under the SEM, and those are the pictures he generated. And this looks very much like little micro nuggets with overfolded rims and so on. But whether you believe it or not, uh, this kind of result uh, was challenged by the hydrothermalists a few years later, who literally actually uh, accused us in Cape Town of, uh, well, they claimed that these images that we produced are artifacts of sample preparation. Well, that was quite a serious um, um, criticism. Uh, luckily, since then, uh, methodology advanced. We have better methods available today. So we can look at these things today in situ uh, without dissolving anything, uh, in situ using micro XD computer tomography. And um, let's see whether yep, it's working. So here you can see now in situ the distribution of gold particles in this particular specimen. And it's pretty obvious. Um, there is no interconnected gold vein system, but we have got a series of discrete little gold grains, little gold nuggets, variably rounded. Uh, so that's exactly what you would expect for a plastic accumulation. So I think with this kind of evidence, um, we can stop the debate on whether the gold is syngenetic or epigenetic. It is syngenetic. It is a paleoplasma. But if that's the case, then we are facing this big, big problem of where did this gold come from? Uh, orogenic Greenstone-hosted gold deposits in the hinterland, we have already discarded. Um, Ross Large and his group suggested a couple of years ago it might have been gold bearing pyrite in sediments lower down in the stratigraphy. And then during metamorphic overprint, uh, this pyrite breaks down, releases the gold and it moves upwards. But then we would still have an epigenetic style of mineralization. And I just tried to convince you that that doesn't work. It's a syngenetic mineralization. The third possibility is if we don't have a discrete um, point source in the hinterland in the form of an eroded gold deposit, we can only generate this huge amount of gold by mobilization of background concentration of gold from somewhere. 
Now, this could be due to metamorphic devolatilization reactions, as is the case in orogenic type gold deposits. But then again, then the gold would be epigenetic. And I tried to convince you that doesn't work. So that leaves us only with one option, and that is mobilization of background gold by syndepositional surface waters. Uh, that sounds a bit crazy uh, at a first glance, because uh, how should that work? But if you try to picture the Mesoarchean uh, world, then uh, maybe this option actually becomes uh, uh, plausible. So just imagine you're now in the Mesoarchean and uh, lean back and uh, dream a little bit of your Archean world. You would have a lot of volcanic CO2 production, um, which is far more intense than silicate weathering, hence we don't have much of carbonates around. Our atmosphere is essentially oxygen-free, otherwise we wouldn't have these huge amounts of detrital pyrite and detrital uraninite in these Archean conglomerates. The rain that's coming out of the Archean clouds would have been like vinegar, very acid, about a pH of four, which invariably would lead to very intense chemical weathering. And if you just imagine you weather a feldspar as an ordinary rock forming mineral um, under such acidic conditions, well, you generate something like kaolinite and uh, that would buffer the pH, this reaction. So what else do we know? We know that the H2S for gasity must have been very high. Otherwise, we wouldn't have these huge amounts of detrital pyrite and also soon sedimentary pyrite. And under these conditions, we can thermodynamically um, model gold solubility and find that gold as a sulfide complex would have actually a very high solubility, about four orders of magnitude higher than we have today. So in other words, Archean meteoric waters must have been loaded with gold. And hence, we don't need any specific point sources anymore. The entire Archean land surface becomes the source for gold um, in the Mesoarchean world. Now we have the gold in solution in meteoric waters. The next step is we need to find a trap to get the gold out of solution. And well, you're familiar with these uh, famous uh, oxygen fugacity versus pH uh, diagrams uh, depicting gold solubility. So if we have our maximum solubility here in this field, then we need to change something in order to precipitate gold. This change could be reduction. In fact, that's uh, the option drawn here. This is a diagram I borrowed from Chris Heinrich from his paper. He suggested that. But you could also go upwards, you increase oxygen fugacity, and you see there are all these contours of equal solubility. They're very close to each other. So just a tiny little change would trigger an enormous effect in terms of gold precipitation. But hang on, I mean, we are talking here about the Archean world. Um, where would we get oxygen from, for instance, in order to trigger such an oxidation? Um, maybe from the first cyanobacteria, maybe from the first microbes that produced oxygen. And therefore, I gave you here as an inset these images of recent cyanobacteria. Um, you see this little oxygen bubble that is dragging the slimy stuff of the cyanobacterium upwards. So if such an oxygen bubble or if our gold bearing meteoric waters hit such an oxygen bubble, that would immediately trigger the position of gold. Uh, now, that's all a very nice hypothesis, but do we have any evidence that this might have actually happened? Um, well, <clears throat> I'm not sure. Um, I can only speculate here, but the speculation is that long before the great oxidation event, we have evidence of sort of first attempts to produce oxygen by microbes. The famous first whiffs of oxygen. And uh, a series of independent studies have suggested over the last decade or so that these first whiffs of oxygen might have already started some three, four, 500 million years before the great oxidation event. That brings us into the time window we are interested in at about 2.9 billion years. So, any evidence for this? Yes, luckily, yes. And these are the so called carbon seams, a very conspicuous feature in some of the Witwatersrand reefs. 
These are millimeter to centimeter thick kerogen layers, perfectly stratiform, sometimes uh, mimicking very delicate sedimentary structures. And what's especially about these kerogen seams, they are incredibly rich in gold. Everything that shines yellow on this slide is actually gold. In some of the Witwatersrand mines uh, or reefs or ore bodies, up to 50% of the total amount of gold extracted actually came not out of the conglomerates as such, but out of such kerogen reefs or these carbon seams. Um, what are they? Well, that's the same debate as on the gold itself. There's some people who suggest that these carbon seams are completely epigenetic related to migrating uh, oils. In other words, they would be pyrobitumen. Various others uh, argue for them representing former microbial mats. Um, Again, I don't have the time here to present you all the evidence for or against. I just want to show you one piece of evidence, which is, in my view, uh, a quite strong argument. And that's the carbon isotope fractionation between the alkane fractions. Uh, it's a study we did some 20 years ago, but uh, it still holds. Uh, and the fact is that in these carbon seams, we have essentially no fractionation across the alkanes. And anybody who works uh, for the oil industry knows that if you have oil that is migrating for a certain distance, well, the, the longer this migration distance, the stronger is the carbon isotope fractionation between the alkanes. Here, we don't see any of that. So that's a strong argument for these carbon seams representing indeed former microbial mats. Well, in these carbon seams, as I said, we find huge amounts of gold, very fine grain gold, very delicate gold, but it's sitting on the surface of these uh, columnar structures that make up these carbon seams. Another piece of evidence uh, is, well, it comes from pyrite. The, um, there's a huge amount of pyrite in any Archean conglomerate anywhere in the world. And typically, we can distinguish between detrital pyrite types, syn sedimentary pyrite, and clearly epigenetic pyrite. And that's this syn sedimentary pyrite. Yeah, these uh, concretionary, these laminated uh, um, pyrite types, they are particularly interesting because in a number of independent studies over the last, well, almost 20, no, not 20, say 15 years, um, we have seen time and again that it's this particular pyrite type, this concentrically laminated syn sedimentary pyrite. That's the pyrite that is particularly rich in a whole bunch of trace elements, including gold. So there must have been something special about the water in which this pyrite grew. Um, Ross Large uh, and his group looked at many, many pyrites, marine pyrites uh, from all sorts of different ages and came to the conclusion that marine pyrite being a proxy for the gold content in seawater. Well, we have a strong variation in, in the gold content of these pyrites, but the highest gold contents in pyrite incidentally comes from the Neo-Archean or Mesoarchean around 2.7, 2.8, 2.9 billion years. So you can read here the conclusion that uh, Ross Large and his group drew. Gold was enriched in the Mesotoniacian oceans several times above present values. Um, Glenn Whaler, in his PhD project with me, um, looked at uh, gold concentrations in uh, marine shales uh, of different ages. And to cut the long story short here, uh, the conclusion is again that at 2.9 billion years, there is a notable enrichment in gold. Um, so something was special at 2.9 billion years in terms of gold content in meteoric waters, in the sedimentary environment, even in the ocean. So putting all of this together, we suggested a few years ago um, that this 2.9 billion year gold event can be explained by the leaching of the Archean land surface by acid rain, leaching of gold, transporting this gold uh, in solution by meteoric waters to the coastal areas, into the ocean, in the wetlands, uh, in uh, along uh, riverbeds, and in coastal wetlands, we had microbial mats that fixed gold, that took the gold out of solution. Gold was precipitated on its surface, 
And then, of course, these microbial mats, well, they're very delicate structures. Uh, their preservation potential is almost nil. Uh, every storm would have reworked these uh, microbial mats, released these fine gold particles, washed them down, downstream, and thus providing a source for these micro nuggets that um, make, at the end of the day, um, the, um, the gold content of the conglomerates. So the origin of the placer gold in these between between conglomerates is essentially fine-grained gold that was fixed on the surface of these microbial mats. Is the between unique? Well, in terms of gold endowment, without doubt. In terms of style of mineralization, not at all. In fact, everywhere where we go. And whatever crater where we find Achaean conglomerates, we'll find a similar style of mineralization. Um, we had a chance to look at some of the conglomerates in India, uh, both in the Singbom craton as well as the Darwa craton, uh, and there's a similar style of mineralization, possibly in congl conglomerates of a very similar age. So back to our story, beginning of the gold cycle. Well, bear in mind, here we have at about 2.75, that's when we have the first peak in orogenic gold. That's when we have the first peak in porphyry gold. But our microbial gold and the resulting placer gold is 200, 250 million years older. So in other words, our endogenous gold type, types of deposits, orogenic porphyries, they're only possible once subduction has set in. And once we had a source in or a gold source in the sediments that were eventually dragged down in subduction zones. So it is absolutely explicable but this, this timing by the onset of more or less modern plate tectonics of subduction processes that were sufficient to fertilize the subcontinental lithospheric mantle to produce uh, these types of gold deposits here. Now, if you look at younger conglomerates, and here are a couple of examples of younger conglomerates of Bidwulthusrin type, just younger in age. Some of them are very rich in gold, like the Ventus to contact reef here in South Africa, um, or the Jacobino or the Moida. Um, the, in, the West, in West Australia, Bilbao Craton. I mean, these are places that are ready for being mined. Uh, similarly, the same applies to a deposit here in the Euronian. All these younger conglomerates, they can be explained by derivation of the gold, the placer gold they're in from very specific point sources in the hinterland. So that's a big difference to the 2.9 billion year old gold in the Witwolter thread. So these younger ones, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there we have proper nuggets, we have uh, detrital quartz grains with gold inclusions, we have all the necessary evidence uh, that we need to trace back this gold to specific um, point sources, concrete gold deposits in the hinterland. So completely different picture uh, compared to the 2.9 billion year gold in the bits. Now, so far so good. If you look at the total amount of gold that we know of, be it in the sense of past gold production or gold grade, then we can see this tremendous peak here at 2.9 billion years. And from there onwards, uh, almost exponential degrees, both in uh, gold tonnage and gold grade. What remains a mystery is why don't we have this kind of gold older than 2.9 billion years? Uh, because we do have sequences with conglomerates, with siliciclastic sedimentary deposits older than 2.9 billion years. Um, so at the moment, that sort of doesn't really make much sense. Uh, why don't we have uh, older Bitwulthusrin type deposits? Here an example of siliciclastic rocks in the Moody's group at the Barberton Greenstone Belt. We even have little microbes there, uh, or at least the remnants of them, sorry. Um, so that's work that is uh, done by the group in Jena. Um, um, Homan et al um, was one of, the, one of the papers that described these features. 
And they compared this with modern cyanobacteria and came to the conclusion, well, it looks very similar. So maybe these uh, carbonaceous accumulations uh, reflect early cyanobacteria. Anyhow, I just want to point out here that we do have evidence of microbial activity long before 2.9 billion years. Now, I know that one of the many listeners here in, uh, in the group um, is sitting in India, um, probably at two or three o'clock in the morning, I don't know, and uh, nevertheless listening in here. Um, and this colleague, he actually described these structures here, which look like microbes, but aren't any. So I'm referring to Rayashi Chakravati. Oh, welcome to you here. Um, I'm mentioning this here at this point, just to warn you that not everything that looks like microbes are essentially of, uh, is essentially of biogenic origin. But th having said this, we have evidence of microbes. So the microbial activity existed prior to uh, 2.9 billion years, yet no big gold accumulations. A very recent piece of work, which is actually still ongoing, uh, deals with copper isotopic uh, uh, analysis of uh, vitrotus rent ores and gold and carbon. And uh, this is, as I said, still ongoing. So I don't want to draw too, too much of conclusions here, but our first preliminary results clearly point at, again, this oxidative gradient that must have been responsible for the precipitation of the gold on these carbon seams. But it doesn't have to be oxygen. Of course, it could be some kind of acidophilic microbes that would uh, play the same trick. Um, we just need a kind of oxidation. Another reason why we don't have large scale gold accumulations in sediments prior to 2.9 billion years could simply be that we didn't have enough land surface. Uh, bear in mind, in the early Achaean, we had a lot of ocean, but very little land. And this emergence of land only came sort of yeah, after 3 billion years ago. Um, maybe that's one of the reasons why we don't have enough gold in the ocean, not, not enough gold in the, in the meteoric waters, because we didn't have much land. But another possibility is that it is a question of climate change. Achaean climate is a very exciting topic. Was it hot? Was it cold? Well, in the literature, you'll find evidence for both. But it wasn't probably neither one or the other. It was both. And it changed. It changed with time. And the evidence for this comes again from the Witwoters Rand. Um, remember, I told you that the Witwoters Rand Basin Fill um, consists of the Lower West Rand Group, the Upper Central Rand Group. The gold is confined, essentially confined to the upper central rent group, to this unit here. Now, interestingly, if you look at the detrital mineralogy, in the west rent group down here, we find lots of detrital feldspar. In the central rent group up there, no detrital feldspar. West rent group has low chemical indices of alteration, um, which of course reflects the presence of feldspar which is in total contrast to the central rent group. Moreover, in the west rent group, we find iron formation. We find iron formation spatially associated with the amyctite, which is clearly of a glaciogenic origin. So here we have lithologic evidence of a cold climate of very low chemical weathering rates, hence the survival of the feldspar. In the central rent group up there, it's the exact opposite. And the boundary between these two groups corresponds roughly to 2.9 billion years. So around 2.9 billion years, we have apparently a major change in the climatic conditions. Further evidence for this uh, change in climate or change in chemical weathering intensity comes from uh, sedimentary geochemistry, be it on the arenitic fractions or the shale fractions, um, which all points towards um, Lower chemical weathering rates in the West Rand group, higher chemical weathering rates in the Central Rand group. And last but not least, if you look at it a bit on a smaller scale, um, these chemical indices of alteration, we found in a study also quite a number of years ago, we found this CIA values to systematically increase in the footfall as we approach 
this red line and the red line stands for an erosional unconformity that is covered by conglomerate and these conglomerates are the gold ore bodies. So effectively, under each of these erosional surfaces, we have this change in CIA and this is nothing else but mimicking or, or reflecting um, chemical weathering decreasing with depth. Today, the mineralogical evidence of this is pyrophyllite, uh, which has been explained by the hydrothermalists as indicating some kind of physidic metasomatism, but it's far too complicated. This pyrophyllite is simply the product of the metamorphic dehydration of original kaolinite, which resulted from these chemical weathering profiles underneath these old paleosurfaces. So, in conclusion, we can first state that we had the first major concentration of gold in Earth's history at around 2.9 billion years, um, going down to 2.78 billion years. So that's roughly the age of the central rent group in the Witwatersrand. rent. And this first concentration of gold, we can explain by the leaching of ordinary background concentrations of gold in the Achaean hinterland. Uh, the transport of that gold by meteoric waters. Um, then we need microbial activity in order to trap that gold. And these gold-rich microbial mats then got mechanically reworked to produce the fine-grained gold micro-nuggets uh, that constitute the very rich fluvial plasters that we find in the 2.9 to 2.78 billion year sedimentary uh, successions. This lack of gold prior to 2.9, um, I tried to explain firstly by the lack of an efficient subduction process, by a change in climate, colder climate prior to 2.9 billion years, and also by a smaller land surface at that time. From there onwards, from our gold mega event at 2.9 billion years onwards, this plaster gold got repeatedly recycled. Um, leading to more or less rich gold blasters in the Neochean and the Paleoproterozoic. From there on, it diminishes. And endogenous gold deposits, we only have from about 2.75 billion years onwards, um, reflecting tectonic recycling of these original blaster accumulations, well, blaster gold accumulations, tectonic recycling by all sorts of processes. Uh, hydrothermal fluids, metamorphic fluids, magmas, and so on, giving rise to this great variety of gold deposit types that uh, we confuse our students with in our economic geology lectures. Yeah, so that's it. Um, if you want to learn more about this, um, here are a few of our papers uh, that uh, deal with this topic I tried to cover in this talk. And uh, that leaves me only with thanking you for listening, thanking SEG for um, inviting me to become Thailand's lecturer this year. It was an absolute great pleasure to travel around in all sorts of different parts, especially the, the USA, um, meet interesting people, have very exciting discussions. Yeah, and with that, I would like to leave it. Uh, I don't know how we're doing time-wise. Um, of course, there will be no question answer time, but if we run out of time and you have questions which you don't want to phrase right now, you've got my email address here. Feel free to contact me uh, whenever you want. Thank you for that interesting talk uh, going through one of a kind place of deposit we have down in the southern part of Africa. And I hope everyone is back from the Mizoakian. So it's, uh, I'll allow a couple of questions. So please make use of the Q&A session to uh, ask your question. And why I allow a couple of seconds for people to frame their question, just to remind whoever is joining us now that please do renew your FEG membership. Uh, it's due at December 30th, so make sure you renew that. And if you're a student who is not registered with FEG, please do sign up to enjoy benefit, benefits such as attending um, this wonderful uh, webinars. So we have, yes. I see a word question already here. Um, shall I read it out first before trying to answer? How do you want to handle this? Hallelujah. 
So, and then you can just give the answer, Hartwig. So we have a question from Joan, uh, says what an interesting presentation. Uh, in recent years, trace elements, especially the rare earth elements content in gold have allowed to differentiate their origin in terms of different geological settings. Is there any study focused on the trace element rare earth content in gold from the Big Battlestrian deposit? Um, yeah, very good question, very valid question. Um, there are studies on trace elements in the Witwatersrand Waters Gold, um, not necessarily on the rare earth elements, to be honest, at least not that I'm aware of, which uh, uh, is a function of uh, these elements being below the detection limit, in, at least in those analyses I'm aware of. But the Witwatersrand Gold has a very unique composition in terms of trace elements, completely different to any other gold that we know of in this world. And uh, maybe the, the best element uh, to mention in this respect is osmium. We know that the Witwatersrand gold contains orders of magnitude more osmium than any other gold in the world, which in itself is already a strong argument against the hydrothermal origin here, yeah, because osmium, of course, doesn't move very easily in aqueous fluids. Um, so, Yes, the trace element composition of the Witwatersrand gold makes the Witwatersrand gold unique. And uh, maybe we also have a unique mode of formation as I tried to, uh, to, to convince you of here today. Um, if, if, I'm, if I'm allowed to dwell on a little bit of this, the gold in the Wits is also very rich in silver and mercury. And that's, a bit surprising because, uh, and I didn't talk about this, uh, but uh, the Witwatersrand and rocks have seen some metamorphic overprint. Uh, they have seen temperatures in excess of 300, 350 degrees. And uh, consequently, um, our today's composition of the Witwatersrand gold, well, has been modified by metamorphism, of course. Um, but the fact that there's still so much silver and mercury left suggests that these concentrate the concentration of these elements was much, much higher in the original gold particles in the bits prior to metamorphism. Ellen, thank you very much. Um, in interest of time, I would really I would ask a question, just maybe if you can briefly answer it. It's uh, from Rashi. Uh, this is great lecture. Quick question. Assuming the absence of the subduction factory before uh, 3 billion. How do we explain the small value at Gen Load Gold, originally gold example, the 3.1 billion Babylon deposits? If you can just answer that briefly. Uh, okay, very briefly. Um, I mentioned to you that we had already some high pressure metamorphism in the Barberton Greenstone Belt at about 3.2 billion years, at 3 billion years. So this was sort of the very beginning of subduction. And maybe that's the reason why in this particular part of the world, we have really sort of the very little bits and pieces of orogenic type gold mineralization. But um, we have to be honest, um, altogether, I think uh, maybe some 350 or 400 tons of gold have been recovered from the Barberton Greenstone Belt. And that's completely, well, it's nothing in comparison to some estimated 90,000 tons of gold in the Witts Basin. Um, it's a question on uh, the uranium. Would you like to comment on the uranium association? I will try to make it very quick. <laughs> I didn't have time to talk at all about uranium, but of course, this is a very exciting and, and interesting story. The Witwatersrand conglomerates are one of the largest uranium deposits in the world. Um, there is a lot of uranium, which is largely bound in uraninite. And we did quite a bit of work on this uraninite, uh, and I can, uh, well, as I said, this would be a separate talk now, but uh, the nutshell is most of the uraninite is detrital, which we can attest based on uh, its chemistry uh, and textual appearance. But of course, as with the gold, as with the pyrite, there's also been some remobilization of the uranium um, to secondary uraninite, to brennerite, to some other minerals. Um, but um, the bottom line here is that the bulk of the uranium in the Witwatersrand rent is bound in detrital uraninite, and that in itself tells us something about the environmental conditions at the, in the Mesoarchean. And, uh, attendees, please do use the Q&A session for questions for easy access and for 
uh, hard to get to them if we are not able to get to them on the live um, section. So there's one question, uh, Patrick, that's a could you feel the nickel moly black shales of the Cumbrian be viable sources for importing gold ores? Uh, okay, once again, can you repeat that one? I couldn't quite The question understand. is on the, on the black shales of the Cumbrian, if they are viable sources for importing gold ores. Oh, now that's of course a completely different story altogether. <laughs> um, well, if you go to, to China, to the Yangtze platform, I think that's probably one of the best places to study Cambrian black shales. Um, we have the famous horizons where we have uh, huge concentrations of PGEs uh, and of gold, of course, also. Um, but it's a completely different mode of gold concentration. And um, it just reflects uh, the, the trap, the, the efficiency of organic carbon to trap these elements, including gold. Um, but I don't think that the Cambrian Ocean uh, is now comparable to what we suggest here as a, as a gold-rich uh, Mesoarchean Ocean. I think uh, the gold endowment in Cambrian shales is more related to the large amount of organic carbon that is present there, uh, but with a more or less normal phenerozoic background uh, oceanic chemistry. Great. Um, looking at the q and so look, we do not have any more questions. It's a great, lots of great comments about the excellent presentation, which I agree with. This was a brilliant presentation. And let's continue the discussion in the chat uh, as we move on to the next speaker. So Hartwig will be, I think, around for a couple of minutes or an hour or so. So feel free to put your, let's continue the discussion. This is the whole point why we have these things live. So let's continue the discussion. Well, thank you all who contributed to the discussion. And as I said earlier on, if you have questions that come up later, then feel free to write to me. Thank you very much again, Hartwig, for that presentation. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to our next speaker, we are very happy to introduce Keiko Hattori, who is the SAP 2022 International Exchange Lecturer. Keiko received her PhD in Geochemistry at the University of Tokyo. Since 1983, at the University of Ottawa, where she teaches courses on mineral deposits and geochemistry. Her ongoing, her ongoing and past research with nearly 50 past and present students and postdocs include element recycling and subduction zones and geochemical and mineralogical studies of porphyry, copper, gold, epithelial gold, silver, the Kuroko based metal, originic gold, and unconformity type uranium deposits. Keiko is an associate editor of several journals, including Economic Geology. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, as well as the Mineralogical Society of America. Next slide, please. Keiko's talk is entitled uh, Magmatism Links to the Formation of High-Grade Epithelial Gold Vein Deposits. Keiko, welcome, and we are looking forward to your talk. The next 45 minutes are yours. Thank you, hallelujah. Uh, sorry, just uh, I need to make... Uh, and uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me over. So just a moment, I need to make... Uh, screen sharing and uh, thank you i hope you can see that screen yes thank you, can you. See the screen um it said just some error so just a minute to remove this one um so today i'm talking about high grade epithermal type gold vein deposit uh, many people already studied this type of gold deposit uh, because of economic importance, as described by previous speaker, Hartwig. However, there are many questions remaining, especially the relationship between igneous rocks and the gold mineralization. So today, I will present nature of magmas linked to 
this high grade epithermal type of gold vein deposits. So, um, uh, doesn't uh, just a moment. Oh, I didn't. Uh, so today, first I will describe briefly what are high grade bonanza forming epithermal type gold deposits and the characteristics of these ore. Then I'll talk about the tectonic development and igneous activity of these selected deposits. I chose four deposits for today's presentation. Is Sado, Hishikari in Japan, and McLaughlin deposit in California. And uh, I'm very familiar with those uh, deposits in Japan, and also that uh, including McLaughlin deposits. All four deposits, we know precise age, and also that uh, igneous activity before and after or during the contem uh, their mineralization, and also precise tectonic setting uh, very well known because of this young age. Then I will describe what are common features of all deposits. Yeah. And I will talk about the nature and the source of these igneous rocks at the time of epithermal type gold uh, mineralization. So, um, low sulfidation, epithermal type of vein deposits, they commonly form bonanza grade ore. Bonanza is defined as gold contents more than 30 gram per ton gold, basically more than one ounce of gold. And uh, those um, high grade epithermal type gold deposits show very distinct characters as shown here, very fine banding of quartz aldoralia and the dark bands. Those dark bands contain most of gold and the silver. And those veins are mainly made of quartz and aldoralia, aldoralia is potasferous part, Therefore, using cobalt nitrates, you can see good staining, yellow staining. And you see fine bandings of quartz adoraria part and also more quartz rich part and also that dark bands. As I mentioned, dark bands contain gold and silver. And they are all very low temperature mineralization. Therefore, all minerals are very fine-grained, as shown here. Uh, this is a sample from Hishikari. And also that uh, they commonly form very fine-grained uh, silica. Uh, they are believed to be solidified colloidal silica. And then that also that uh, these deposits are formed all very shallow uh, levels, typically 300 meters uh, from the paleo surface. Therefore, those gold-bearing fluids are discharged on the surface and precipitating silica, forming silica center on the paleo surface. And most deposits are very young, like Hishikari, about only one million years young, and also McLaughlin deposit, again, about one million years. Um, this is uh, showing a million years, but there are older examples, those old high-grade deposits, some are even that, uh, like Avalon in Newfoundland in Precambrian age. 
They are preserved because shallow clustered sections are retained in that uh, uh, tilted um, uh, the strata. Another very important aspect of these high grade gold ore is the nature of ore fluids, quite different from other type of gold deposit, uh, other type of mineral deposits. They are all low salinity, less than two weight percent NaCl equivalent, and many oxygen hydrogen those isotope study carried out for many many deposits, and they show a similarity with the local metallic waters, meaning is a those ore forming fluids are dominated by heated metallic water. Meaning is that mineralization took place in subaerial conditions, even though some are actually hosted by submarine rocks. But the important mineralization was a uh, sub area. So now that I will talk about specific areas, as I mentioned, is Sado, Hishikari, and, um, and the McLaughlin deposit in uh, California. They are common geological features, including the nature of igneous rocks and the timing of the magmatism associated with th these deposits. Uh, that is the main focus of today's presentation. And I believe key findings from these young deposits are relevant to all the trains and perhaps useful in exploration. So as I mentioned, first I will talk about gold deposit in Izo. Uh, Japan host, uh, Japan contains uh, uh, many, uh, those are bonanza forming low sulfidation gold deposits. And uh, after Izu, I'll talk about uh, Sado, and I'll talk about uh, Hishikari. And as, I, as you can see, many are very young uh, age of mineralization. So Izu is located here. So this is a present day tectonic setting of Japan. Uh, so in Japan, there's a Pacific plate uh, producing at the very uh, eastern part of the Pacific Ocean, traveled here, subducting below Japan Trench, below northeastern part of Japan, and also Kuril Trench forming a Kuril Arc. And here, this subducting below Philippine Sea Oceanic Plate, forming Izubonin Arc, Izubonin Mariana Arc. And this is is a northern uh, end of this Izubonin Mariana Arc. So, is a Bonin Marian arc, as I mentioned, on a Philippine Sea plate by subduction of this Pacific plate. This subduction started about 47 million years ago. And the entire Philippine Sea plate is a subducting below western part of Japan, meaning is this arc, arc volcano is a keep moving north, north westward. So Isbrook, when we just focus Isbrook, more than 20 million years ago, this was a submarine volcano. And uh, deep sediment, uh, deep water sediments and the volcano were um, there. And then that movement of a plate about 20 million years ago, because closer to the south, uh, closer to the main island, shallowing, therefore several submarine volcanic rocks were now merged above uh, water. Then uh, 10 million years ago, 
uh, uh, this distinctly several of the volcano are above water, but still that many submarine volcanic rocks. Now, closer to the time now, two million years ago, is block uh, merged as a land and erosion produced lots of sediments surrounding that land block. And some time between 1 million and 2 million years ago, this collided, this is block collided to main main island of Japan. Therefore, those accretional uh, sediments uh, deposited and also this collision uh, because of oblique subduction, this collision made this entire block rotating far away from volcanic front. So this uh, subduction of Pacific plate was making volcanic arc, but now is block become away from volcanic front. And about 0 0.6 million years ago, uh, more this uh, subduction of the western part below uh, mainland of Japan and the eastern part of the peninsula is subducting again that the eastern part of the mainland. Double subduction started and this is now uh, closer to the present day 0 0.2 million years ago. Lots of the sediments accumulated between main, mainland and is broke. So, as I mentioned, rotation, collision, made double subduction, and this is the present day. Uh, this double subduction, and this is a fairly small peninsula, uh, maximum 40 kilometers or less than 40 kilometers. So this double subduction made a very, very strong extension of regime around here. Uh, because of that extension, uh, the crust was uh, thinned. Therefore, astenosic, astenosic mantle ascent closer to the surface. Uh, therefore, uh, lots of mafic mag magmatism occurred because of this double subduction extension regime. Thick basaltic lavas flowed and uh, and also lot of many scoria cones were produced in the area. And this is a distribution or occurrence of present day, those monogenic volcanoes, are many on land and also many in offshore because of, again, that this uh, uh, extension regime, asthenosphic upwelling and uh, those uh, uh, helium isotope studies, and also at the uh, uh, new remember, strontium isotope studies confirm, yes, a uh, strong astronospheric mantle signature. So now look at those gold deposits in Izo. Gold veins started to form after 1.5 million years ago, meaning is that uh, already double subduction started. Double subduction, uh, this uh, subduction of the western part and uh, therefore the uh, extension of regime and uh, orientation of gold veins are consistent with this uh, extension. And eastern part, now this area is covered by uh, more recent uh, those uh, monogenic uh, um, uh, volcanic activity and uh, uh, but again that consistent with that extension related to this uh, uh, double subduction and the gold deposits um, have a very distinct uh, textures uh, coming in a many low sulfidation gold deposit anywhere in the world as you can see fine binding and dark bands with the high gold and the silver. This is from Sego Shimai. Uh, this is a, de a deposit I studied a long time ago as my undergraduate thesis project. 
So this is a brief summary of either volcanism, submarine arc volcanism ended. And then at, uh, well, during that time, there's uh, already that accretion of sediments and of volcanic rocks. And those accretion started in the mainland. And then a collision happened before, probably around 2 million years ago. Therefore, double subduction, extension of lithosphere, asthenospheric upwelling, a dike swarm, and a monogenic a volcano, and a gold veining mineralization. This is a se sequence. And uh, so submarine condition to subaerial condition, extension, and then gold mineralization. So now move to the uh, Sado deposit. Sado mine is located in that very, very eastern margin of Japan Sea. This mine produced more than 77 tons of gold. And by mining started way before even 16th century. And this was a wealth producing deposit during those shogun government in for more than 300 years. Therefore, actual figure of gold produced sub mine is probably far, far, far more than 77 tons of gold. And potassium ergon, uh, uh, ergon sorry, age of potassium feldspar shows two ages, but most likely they are that um, age uh, of the mineralization is about 14 million years ago, but probably minor gold mineralization happened 24 to 21 million years ago. And uh, these dates correspond to rift related mafic magmatism, I'll show. So again, that the saddle is here now, and uh, this shows um, uh, before 44 million years ago. Entire Japan used to be uh, the eastern margin of Asian continent. And then at uh, uh, this 44 million years ago or older continental arc magmatism is recorded in Korean Peninsula. And then at uh, this uh, rifting started and uh, forming Japan uh, Sea, now underlain by oceanic crust, oceanic lithosphere. So southern mine is located here in the center of these uh, rifting. So 25 million years ago, about the oceanic ridge formed in the northern part of Japan Sea, asthenospheric mantle-derived magmas are pro produced oceanic floor. Again, Sado is here. And uh, because of rifting, many, many, many rift basin was produced. About 15 million years ago, the, this rifting moved to more eastern part of Japan Sea. So because many rifting and therefore starting to form sedimentary basin. Uh, first started as a lake and a large lake and uh, originally not totally open to ocean. Therefore, many semi-closed basin was developed. Uh, therefore, uh, lots of uh, deposition of organic matter, therefore forming uh, present day, actually this area is oil gas field. Japan has only economically uh, extractable oil gas field. This is only here around the southern mine, meaning that this area has very thick uh, sediments. Uh, some area has far more than 500 meter thick sediments. So now look at the gold veins. Um, gold veins are mainly east-west 
So uh, some east, uh, north, east, uh, no, east, northeast. And uh, there are many dikes forms related to this opening of Japan Sea. And orientation changed a lot because of that very complex um, process of producing Japan Sea. And uh, dikes formed during this about 14 million years ago. This orientation of dikes form, uh, we can get to those horizontal sigma max. This is about 90 degree, coinciding with uh, the orientation of the gold veins, indicating gold mineralization formed in the same stress field as a dike swarms about 14 million years ago. So this is a time sequence of a subtle gold mineralization. As I mentioned, the Japan Sea. This is an entire Japan Sea, some continental arc magmatism happened in the western part, now we go to the Korean Peninsula, uh, before 44 million years ago, and some explosive Mayfield volcanism started, dike swarm started, sedimentation, and then at, um, uh, again at another dike swarm and the sedimentation. So we look at the local area, meaning a Sado Island, eastern part of Japan Sea, uh, recording of the southern sedimentation, marine sediments. Then a dike swarm started. At uh, this stage, the area becomes sub-area. And then at uh, some uh, there are minor gold mineralization and a major gold mineralization 40 million years ago, coinciding with the timing of MAF dike swarms, asthenospheric derived dike swarms, and mafic magmatism. So now, uh, change the subject in a Hishikari area in a southern part of um, South Island, Kyushu Island. Hishikari is located here. And uh, current uh, volcanic front related subduction is uh, defining, uh, defined here by Kirishima volcano and Satojima. Hishikari is not in a volcanic front. And uh, Hishikari uh, or again, not very similar to any low sulfidation gold veins in the, anywhere in the world. Again, very fine banding of quartz adularia and the dark band containing most of gold and the silver. Um, because high-grade gold ore at Hishikari is hosted by Cretaceous Shimanto Greywack basement. Therefore, look at this distribution of basement, uh, Shimanto basement rocks. This is uh, Shimanto basement rocks formed uh, the accretional prism uh, started in early Cretaceous, Cretaceous time to early tertiary time. This is a very large accretional prism in the eastern uh, Japan, east, east coast of Japan, from this uh, southern part of South Island and to all the way to Tokyo. So this is a host of this gold deposit and the Hishikari is located here. And this oriferous veins are also that extending to lower andesite. Lower andesite, this andesite is 0.9 million years. Therefore, we know oriferous hydrothermal activity at least continued or uh, 0.9 million years ago. And now we know, based on many potassium argon dating, 
approximately about 1 million years and continued younger than 0 0.9. So this is a local geology of Hishikari area. So just to look at this vertical section of this area. As I mentioned, this is a Greywake Shimanto. This is a very thick sediments, more than 20 kilometers. And then this Cretus gray, gray work host most of those high grade ore, overlain by this uh, Hishikari andesite. Hishikari lower andesite contains mainly lavas, but some pyroclastic rocks. And then uh, the, uh, this Hishikari andesite is overlain by more ferrisic, intermediate to ferrisic igneous rocks, like uh, daysite and uh, rhyolite. And uh, this is a projection of this uh, gold ores on, projected on the surface. As you can see, this uh, Hishikari ore is located in this area here, here. And uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, this uh, deposit very shallow. Uh, depth of mineralization, therefore, outflow of oriferous fluid uh, went to the uh, paleo surface, forming lacustrine uh, or sinter deposit lacast and a sinter deposit in uh, lacustrine sediments. So, look at this lower andesite, lower andesites. Um, some are lavas, some are pyroclastics, and uh, some contain very good olivine phenocrystal. And this is not a xenocrystal because magnesium ion ratios are equilibrium with that ground mass and also bulk rock. Uh, meaning is that this lower andesite, now andesite, however, this started as a basaltic magma. Uh, but went through very thick sediments, therefore assimilated silica uh, became, therefore become andesite. But obviously that it was quick uh, to retain those olivine crystals. So now look at these volcanic rocks and uh, Shimanto sediments, uh, uh, because this is Cretaceous sediments, Sonchem isotope ratio are uh, very high in 87. But uh, these uh, those volcanic rocks around the Hishikari deposit distinctly different. Uh, this shows this uh, um, volcanic rocks originated from atmospheric derived uh, magma. And also when we look at uh, Volcanic front magma like Sakurajima, Kirishima, even those volcanic front magma are slightly uh, are different from these magmas associated with um, uh, the Hishikari mineralization. So these magmas are, are not greatly affected by those hosting uh, thick sediments and distinctly different from subduction related magmas in the area because they were derived from asthenospheric magma, uh, mantle, sorry. So also when we look at strontium isotope compositions of adularia in our veins, uh, similar to volcano rocks, are uh, very distinctly different from Shimanto sedimentary rocks, even though that and uh, mostly um, entirely hosted by Shimanto sedimentary rocks. So how this could happen? How that the, uh, geological setting allows this kind of asthenospheric mantle derived magma to come up to the surface? So um, in Japan that more than 15 years um, they started to have uh, uh, GPS measurements in uh, many stations 
to observe cluster deformation. And we found Kyushu here, Hishikari is located here, uh, rotating uh, due to oblique subduction. And also that, uh, as I mentioned, is block collided. This pushed, pushed main part of Japan, Japan, Japan islands to more north, north westward. But in that southern part of Kyushu, and also that there is arc, uh, the um, uh, arc is uh, moving away from mainland. And the Hishikari is located is a center of this uh, very large lithospheric extension. So this is a geological sequence of Hishikari. Very thick accretional prism, accumulation of cement sediments, mainly a shale, sandstone, and uh, during those early Cretaceous time to early tertiary time. But locally around the Hishikari area, those rocks are Cretaceous in age. And this accretion made uplifting this area, and therefore became a subaerial condition. And this huge um, rotational movement of entire island uh, made rifting in this area, large extension. This extension uh, produced uh, Astenospheric upwelling because that uh, lithosphere become very thin. Astenospheric upwelling. This allows allowed upwelling of mafic magmas, extrusion of mafic mag magmas through even very thick sedimentary rocks. Uh, these magmas assimilate minor sediments, therefore forming andesite and also younger one, even daysite, and uh, even rhyolite. And these, uh, these magmas contain high magnesium olivine, olivine, confirming, yes, they are originally mafic magma, and because minor assimilation made andesite and bulk rock composition erupted 1.5 to 1 million years ago. And gold mineralization bulk is less than 1 million years, coinciding with the timing of high magnesium uh, olivine bearing andesite. Yeah. So now I shift to eastern part of Pacific, or western part of the North American continent, McLaughlin deposit in California. Uh, this produced 109 tons of gold. Again, this is 1 million years of mineralization located here in California. Again, that I showed in earlier, the uh, ore has a very distinct characteristics similar to many other bonanza forming epithermal type uh, deposit. So uh, I showed macro McLaughlin deposit is here. And just I like to show uh, the, um, this area of a tectonic setting here, called the oceanic plate and Juan de Fuca oceanic plate subducted producing a Cascadia volcanic chain. Uh, still, this is active. As we know, like Mount Saint Helen, Mount, sorry, Mount Saint Helen. And, uh, uh, but McLaughlin deposit is here, outside of this Cascadia volcanic chain. And uh, so, and, uh, uh, this area is underlain by very thick accretional prism called Franciscan 
uh, complex. Again, Franciscan complex, just like a Shimanto in that, uh, uh, Japan. Uh, mainly sediments with the minor volcanic rocks. And also this area has a quark sediments called the Great Valley sediments accreted again that uh, this whole area. Meaning is that uh, this uh, McLaughlin deposit is un underlain by thick sedimentary rocks. Uh, as I mentioned, volcanic rocks here uh, not related to this Cascadia. However, that uh, those uh, uh, volcanic rocks are present uh, related to San Andreas Fault, very large strike slip fault. This large strike slip fault produced floor part type basin, floor part type extension allowed uh, atmospheric mantle derived magmatism like Sonoma volcanic rocks, 13.6 to 2.7, and Clear Lake volcanic rocks, 2.24 to 0.26 million years. So, this Clear Lake volcanic magmatism coinciding with mineralization at McLaughlin uh, deposit one million years ago. So this is a more local geology. As I mentioned, this area, very thick, very thick Franciscan, this accretional prism uh, cropping out in a, uh, uh, locally, and also very thick, um, those valley uh, sediment. This valley sediment, as I mentioned, was four sediments. Uh, before accretion. And uh, so McLaughlin deposit, McLaughlin deposit is uh, here. Thick sediments and uh, geophysical work shows uh, this Franciscan sediment is very thick, more than 15, uh, probably more than 18 kilometers in uh, thickness. So again, McLaughlin is uh, here. Um, McLaughlin deposit. Uh, produced very spectacular dendritic gold shown here. And uh, um, this is a uh, uh, location of this uh, McLaughlin gold uh, deposit along this uh, Stony Creek Fault, one of those uh, fault associated with or uh, uh, related to um, their San Andreas Fault, and uh, this uh, gold mineralization, and uh, this uh, Clear Lake Basalt, Clear Lake Volcanic Rocks are uh, here. As I mentioned, the timing was uh, contemporaneous with this uh, mineralization. And uh, oriferous fluids uh, discharged to uh, surface, producing large sinta deposit and very large those clay alteration. So now uh, this just shows a photograph taken by Sherlock and uh, very uh, voluminous undecided flows and uh, breacher uh, along the um, McLaughlin deposit. And this is a strontium again at the New Dima isotope uh, uh, compositions of Clear Lake volcanic rocks. As you can see, Clear Lake volcanic rocks passed through Franciscan accretional complex and also Gray Valley uh, sediments. Uh, but clearly, this magma uh, uh, derived from asthenospheric mantle. And, high new remember I stop uh, compositions and the low 87 86 ratios and uh, little interaction with uh, Franciscan and the uh, great very uh, sequence sedimentary rocks so again that uh, this is a brief geological sequence of a uh, McLaughlin gold deposit 
very thick accretional prism formed as a Franciscan complex. This is Cretaceous sediments with the minor sediment, minor volcanic rocks. And for sediments, uh, valley sequence, also that uh, formed and all accreted. This is all marine sediments. Now uplifting happened because of accretion and uplifting uh, made this area subaerial conditions. Then at the strike slip San Andreas Fault, actually this is even that active, even that uh, before uplifting, but then yes, strike slip San Andreas Fault produce local extension, like a proper type extension. This um, allowed mantle derived magmatism, Sonoma volcanic rocks, and clearly volcanic rocks. And the gold mineralization is synchronous uh, as clear, clear, sorry, clear like volcanic rocks. So we see that lots of similarities with the mana, many those deposits. But uh, just before, I'd like to mention those oxidation, <clears throat> sorry, oxidation conditions. This is a summer. Summary of many oxidation conditions of magmas. And uh, uh, many subduction related magmas uh, have a very high oxidized conditions because subducted uh, slab uh, discharge oxidized species. But astenospheric mantle has a very reduced oxidation conditions. This is the reason that the middle oceanic rigid basalt coming from a atmospheric mantle has a low oxidation condition. This is a, some scale of oxidation conditions related to ferrite magnetite quartz buffer. And as you can see, this is a logarithmic scale, meaning is that many atmospheric mantle derived magma has a almost two order of magnitude lower in FO2 than many subduction related uh, magmas. And also this shows that the boundary between reduced sulfur and oxidized sulfur. So um, meaning asthenospheric derived magma has a lower FO2. And as I mentioned, those magmas associated with um, a high grade gold deposits are derived from asthenospheric mantle, meaning the magma had a low FO2. And minor assimilation of sediments, because sediments have low FO2 reduced conditions, therefore probably even lowered FO2 conditions of magma. And therefore, those magma, these metals are sequestered, not, re not released to upper crustal levels. This probably likely uh, uh, separated gold from base metals. So now this is a, a summary of uh, yeah, summary, uh, sedimentation, uh, thick accretional prism or basin sedimentation, uplifting, subaerial conditions, extension by rotation or big strike slip movement, and atmospheric mantle derived mafic magmatism, and minor assimilation sediments and producing some intermediate ferrous rocks. And then a gold mineralization is a synchronous with this magmatism. Uh, this reduced oxidation conditions of those magmas associated with this high grade uh, mineralization is a poor and the paucity of base metals 
in these high-grade epithermal type deposit are probably that's all consistent. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, also I like to thank SG for uh, providing this opportunity to present my presentation. And also that uh, SEG exchange lecture, I could visit many universities, meeting with many students. It was a really wonderful experience. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Keiko, for that um, comprehensive presentation on the vein deposits. I think I've learned a thing or two about Japan is learning the gold in Japan. So thank you for that. I would like to remind the audience that please do use the Q&A session for the questions. It will be easy to access and your question will be able to be passed on to Keiko to answer the question. Um, but I give the audience a couple of minutes to formulate their questions. Just another kind reminder to please um, renew your SEG membership. It's due end of uh, December. And if you're a student or early career that is not part of the SEG, please do sign up. There are a lot of benefits and only if you're a member, you are able to enjoy the benefits. So please sign up for the uh, SEG uh, membership. So either that the presentation was so clear, no question or didn't understand anything of what I said, <laughs> therefore no question. First one, I think the presentation was really clear, but um, so the presentation was clear and I think um, that's a good sign. So you, I have a question while I'm allowing the participants to, um, the audience to formulate their questions. Um, you thanked um, the chapters because you have visited a couple of student chapters where you have given talk. So could you tell us your experience while visiting the student chapters and the value of the program? Uh, yes, that uh, uh, it was uh, because without this uh, uh, program, I don't think I visited uh, many universities and also that, uh, for example, that the meeting with as undergraduate students, graduate students at uh, other universities, and I found all uh, very enthusiastic and uh, I got uh, many questions, not only uh, scientific questions, but also many questions related to career development. And uh, so I, I found, uh, uh, as I said, a very rewarding experience. And uh, uh, I guess also that I'm from some, uh, not from Canada, and therefore originally I was educated in Japan. And uh, people were curious how I could uh, uh, go to even that uh, go to job in uh, Canada and uh, how uh, I become a uh, you know, professor in that uh, uh, Canadian university and all those uh, many, many questions. So sometimes the question was only maybe allocated one hour, but often that entire afternoon and uh, talking to uh, um, individuals, some students, uh, it was very, very interesting, yes. Great to hear. So I'm sure a lot of students benefited from that, like you said. So um, yeah, our chapter pro, we will invite you definitely to Dublin to also visit uh, Dublin to, to our chapter, the NUY SEG chapter here. I think we can also benefit from your wisdom. Um, I think I had given attendees a couple of minutes and we do have a couple of questions. Uh, there's a question here, it says, your talk focused on Bonanza grade deposits. Do you see the same association of asthenosphere sourced magmas with lower grade epithelial deposits? Uh, which deposit? Sorry, I could not hear. So the question is, your talk focused on Bonanza gold um, yes. grade deposits. Do you see the same association of the asthenosphere sourced magmas with lower grade epithelial deposits? Uh, uh, like, um, uh, uh, but you know that, of course, that asthenospheric uh, derived magma is quite often related to like a nickel copper deposit. And, uh, uh, but uh, IRGD deposit, uh, what is, uh, just I'm trying to read this uh, question. 
ask, um, it's so anonymous, if they can maybe rephrase that question and then I'll come back to it. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, um, this interesting presentation, uh, many similarity to the carbon Paris epithelial goal in Australia, especially in the setting, igneous relation, um, how extension here are present of episodal IRG with clear igneous relation also. I think this is more of a comment. So okay. just Greg is sort of citing the similarities between uh, what you presented and the carbon ferrous epithelial in Australia. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, because uh, I'm not familiar with the carboniferous deposit in Australia, uh, but in Australia has uh, uh, not much erosion. Uh, that's the reason that uh, still that uh, Paleozoic uh, epithelial type gold deposits are pretty, uh, very well preserved and uh, uh, quite a, uh, a great comment. So uh, to know uh, this is applicable to a very old deposit. Yeah, thank you very much. There's another comment and an extra question from Malaysia says, nice presentation um, and thank you. And I wonder why the asthenosphere related gold deposits is not common as arc related gold deposits. We could not see much gold deposits in all extensional regions. Would you like to comment on that? Uh, this is a very interesting question, uh, perhaps related to that, uh, for example, that uh, uh, many, many extension regime, of course, uh, you can go to the even alpha delta uh, and uh, purely extensional regime and also uh, uh, the sub-area, uh, sub uh, they are sub-area condition. Uh, do we have a possibility to have a large gold deposit or is uh, something to do with those uh, very thick sediments. Uh, that's what we may have to, be to look into. What is the role of those uh, sedimentary rocks? I don't, I don't have that answer for that yet. Um, we have another two questions for you, Keiko. Yeah. The next one is from David. A very interesting presentation, thank you. Do you see a difference in the lithology or tectonic signatures between high, intermediate, and low sulfidation epithelial deposits? Uh, because uh, high sulfidation gold deposits, uh, they don't form high grade. Usually they are disseminated. And the setting is quite different because high sulfidation gold deposits are uh, associated with a porphyry copper deposit. Therefore, that magma type is totally different because coffee copper deposit that requires highly oxidized magmas. And uh, uh, that's the reason that copper and the sulfur can come up uh, close to the uh, uh, inner surface and the shallow crustal level. But uh, uh, therefore, high sulfidation gold deposit totally, totally different from that uh, low sulfidation deposit or some, I, I believe that some of the intermediate sulfidation state gold deposit is kind of a bit of similar to low sulfidation deposit. But so high sulfidation or not a high sulfidation tectonic setting and also type of magmas associated with that uh, mineralization, very different. That's the reason they don't occur together. Well, at least, uh, Ages are totally different. Brilliant, brilliant. We have one last question before we can let you go. Uh, it's anonymous. So this was an interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, the question is um, concerning the gold mineralization of the San Antonio Fault. Is the mineralization more than in the other area where the fault isn't as extensive? Uh, is uh, San Antonio, so uh, uh, he spelled uh, San Antonio. I don't know what, what is a uh, San Antonio fault. So he wrote uh, San Antonio. Yeah. Is this a typographic yeah. error of uh, San Andreas? Or? Anonymous, if you can just rectify the fault in that, that will be appreciated. Because, uh, I talked about uh, in a McLaughlin deposit, the McLaughlin deposit is associated with San Andreas Fort. San Andreas Fort is a big 
uh, strike slip fault. Um, so question is, is there mineralization more than in the area where the faulting is not as extensive? Actually, there are several smaller deposits um, similar to that uh, um, this McLaughlin deposit, but uh, smaller than McLaughlin deposit. I did not talk about those smaller deposits, but uh, there are several in a California. Great, thank you. Again, I would just like to remind everyone to kindly use the Q&A session, the Q&A button for the questions, as some of the questions may get lost if we put them in the chat box. Um, last question before we go for the break. Uh, it's in the chat, but I will read it out. Um, it says, are there any interesting comparisons between these deposits to the high-grade silver deposits under the subduction of the Cocos Plate in Mexico? That's, that's another interesting uh, thing about the silver deposit, of course, in Mexico is uh, associated with many, you know, those uh, huge um, uh, sediments. Um, uh, but the problem is that uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, those tectonic setting is a bit complicated and slightly older among, uh, I need a bit of study that, uh, but sometimes very difficult to, figuring out. And, but in the case of a silver deposit, I'm not so sure what is the relationship of uh, the asthenospheric derived magnetism, because I'm not very well, at least that reported yet. Thank you. Uh, in your talk, you kept, you uh, kept talking about the adularia. So there is a question, it says, what is the importance of the presence of adularia in these deposits? Does it have any significance? Uh, because uh, the uh, presence of adularia instead of elite, indicating that uh, uh, ore forming fluid was near neutral, not very acidic. So that is a significance. And we know that uh, many deposits has almost always some potassium minerals, but adularia indicating quite uh, uh, neutral uh, conditions of fluid. It looks like you are uh, no more questions for you, Keiko. So I'd like to thank you for the brilliant talk and for engaging with the participants with through this amazing discussion of um, answering the questions. Okay, anytime that uh, uh, people know my email address, uh, I'm welcome. Any questions? Thank you. No, thank you. All right. Um, so we will be taking a break and uh, we will be back um, 20 minutes past the hour. So that will be 3.20 if you are mountain time. And if you are like me, that will be just 20 minutes past 10 um, o'clock. Let's go grab your drink of choice and uh, we will convene in the next, in 12 minutes.
All right, I hope everyone has grabbed be it a drink of choice or some snacks or lunch, dinner. Um, we will be starting up shortly. And totally unrelated, it is snowing in Dublin and that's really a big deal for people living in Dublin. <laughs> All right, um, so welcome back everyone or welcome to those that are just joining us. So we'll be continuing or we'll be starting up with our second half of the lecture symposium. But before we start with the next talk, we'd like to share a brief message uh, from Chico Azevedo, the FTG president. Hola a todos, buenos dias, bon dia, good morning everyone. I'd like to take this opportunity, as we close this year, to recognize some very relevant contributions to our society. Starting with the lecturers presenting today, Hartwig, Keiko, Elizabeth and Caroline, your voluntary work and your commitment is the main base for the present and the future success of our society. Thank you. I also want to say thanks to the several committees with whom I interacted during the year. Their response meant a tremendous motivation for the hard work to advance our main objectives in SEG. And thanks to the Council and Executive Committee for their continued commitment and support, and especially to our staff working out of Littleton office or remotely. Their efforts in achieving the goals proposed during the year are the sound basis for our society. As a quick balance for this year, I believe our hybrid conference in Denver was our main achievement, not without the significant challenges in organizing a first in-person conference post-pandemic. If the number of attendees was less than you normally had in the past, the opportunity to meet face-to-face -face with membership and particularly the opportunity to debate how we can continue to have a strong SEG has shown that our conference are very important events to our members. So. Congratulations to Moura, Chair of the conference, and all the people involved in its organization. Looking towards the near future, I am excited with the prospects of our upcoming conference in August 2023 in London. I have been following closely the advances of the organizing, organizing committee, and I am in a position to say that Bob Foster and his team in London and the SEG staff in Littleton are doing a great job. So, I look forward to meeting you personally in London next year. One of the main efforts during the last year has been related to students' activities. And I'm proud to say that in the last couple of years, 10 new student chapters have been created or brought, brought back to activity, including five in South America, one in Asia, and one in Africa. Our desire to expand towards regions where our presence has lots of potential for growth are starting to become reality. The recent creation of the Zambia student chapter was the result of a concentrated effort by several people, and I hope it will be successful and help expanding our reach in Africa. I also would like to comment that during the year, I have received significant support from membership and key people about my proposition to balance the cornerstones of SEG by increasing our outreach and being more collaborative with other scientific and professional organizations. As pointed out by our first president, Penrose, over 100 years ago, the foundation of our society was not due to any controversy with any other society. Actually, it started out with the encouragement and best wishes of all allied societies. They all thought that there was a place for SEG and that they would collaborate with it. Before I conclude, I would like to say a big thank you to Brian Ho, who, during the current transition phase to a new executive director, has been very supportive and have saved no efforts in sharing his knowledge so our society could continue to perform at a high level. In a few weeks, I will pass the baston to Stuart Simmons. One of Stuart's main contributions this year was to put together and chair the search committee, who did a great, great job in selecting excellent candidates 
for the position of the executive director. Process that's currently being concluded. Thank you, Stuart, and good luck next year. It has been a great honor for me to serve as the SEG president this year and contribute for its continued construction. Times with change and challenges like these we are experiencing now are also times for opportunities. And I am convinced that SEG will benefit from it, becoming a more inclusive and strong, stronger society. Thank you and happy holiday season to all. Felices fiestas, boas festas, muchas gracias. Muito obrigado. Great message from uh, Chico de, uh, that leads us nicely into the third speaker for this um, symposium. That is Elizabeth Holly, who is the SEG 2022 Distinguished Lecturer. Elizabeth Holly is um, an exploration and mining geologist who studies the processes responsible for ore deposit genesis, as well as the geological characteristics that determine how ore bodies are developed, mined, and reclaimed. She is an associate professor jointly appointed in the Department of Mining Engineering and the Department of Geology and Geological Engineering at Colorado School of Mines in the US. Dr. Holly serves as the site director for the National Science Foundation, a funded industry university cooperative research center for advanced subsurface earth resource models. Her interdisciplinary work examines the intersection between technical and social risks in mining. She is a fellow of the Pine Institute for Public Policy. Dr. Holly has worked in industry on different five different continents and she contributed to the discovery of the white gold deposit in Yukon. She is a fellow of the Society of Economic Geologists and has organized nearly 200 professional development short courses for SEG. Elizabeth talk today is entitled Responsible Critical Minerals, Transforming Mining for the Energy Transition. Elizabeth, we are happy to have you. Please take us away. Thank you so much. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity to talk with you all. I also want to thank the organizers for all of the time and effort that they put into putting this together and thanks to everybody for joining. I also want to let you know that I'm home today with sick children and so you probably will hear some background noise, but hopefully they won't make any surprise appearances. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Hang on just a second. No worries. <laughs> it always takes me a second to figure it out. All right. Do you have the right view? Yes, we do. Awesome. All right. Well, let's start to talk about responsible critical mineral supply. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge the hundreds of people across so many different organizations that have interacted with me and my team on this project. We're so grateful for everyone's time and input, and I'll be highlighting some of our case studies with our collaborators today. Um, we also welcome additional collaboration, both in the science and in terms of, of case studies out in the industry. So thanks for listening. Before I begin, I want to talk to you a little bit about the global context of critical minerals. I think everybody who's listening probably knows that the future will be minerals and metals intensive. And there is growing concern about the availability of those materials, particularly those that are essential in green energy technologies. In addition to growing demand, we also need to think about some other important trends that are going to change the global context in which mining operates. First, there's a growing awareness of environmental justice issues in the extractive sector. I also think that the generation that's coming of age and starting to take leadership roles now is concerned about the history of resource colonialism, where powerful people come from somewhere else to develop a resource. 
Alongside this, worldwide, we see an increasing recognition of the concerns and rights of Indigenous people and other marginalized groups. And when we start to put forward pro projects for permitting, we're seeing well-mobilized environmental NGOs that are bringing not just local stakeholders to the table to join in the conversations about whether or not individual operations should go forward, but really a global group of stakeholders. Our current framework for social license is really locally focused and fairly transactional. And I think that this is incompatible with globalization. So we're gonna to need to think about how to do things differently. Since my funding is US focused, I'm gonna be giving you case studies today from the United States. And here in the US, the Biden administration has been prioritizing a domestic supply of critical minerals but our permitting process is not necessarily smooth. We also see, I think, an interest in domestic competitiveness and a moral desire to help prevent energy sacrifice zones where the raw materials essential for the energy transition come from elsewhere in the world and leave environmental and social impacts in those places. But at the same time, particularly in the developed world, we have sort of a not in my backyard perspective. And this leads to cognitive dissonance. Where are we gonna get these materials that we need to build society as we envision it? At the same time, we're seeing new markets for ethically sourced gold and cobalt and other materials. And alongside this, there's a very concerning potential for greenwashing projects that might not actually address all of the above concerns or might not be ethical in every way. The other way to see all of these concerns is that the energy transition is an opportunity to develop new approaches for mineral extraction. And I think we need a holistic framework that integrates all of different technical constraints as well as the environmental, social, and governance context. So I'm going to be talking to you from that interdisciplinary perspective today, and I think my, my goal is to convince you that economic geology plays a very important role in this interdisciplinary conversation, and that we all need to become better collaborators, more sophisticated collaborators with other disciplines. So all of these concerns led me to build our Responsible Critical Minerals Project team. We're funded by the National Science Foundation under a solicitation called Growing Convergence Research. And this is NSF's approach to solving really vexing problems by bringing people from all different disciplines together to solve very complicated problems. Um, and that's what they call convergence, is bringing people together. So we do science and we also have a convening role. Our job is to bring together people from different organizations and different parts of the world to have this conversation. So thanks for the opportunity to talk about it today. Um, our team, we only have one faculty member from each discipline. That's sort of what we're allowed to have. Um, and we represent the whole mining life cycle. So I'm doing the economic geology. We've got mining engineering, geotechnical engineering, metallurgical engineering, environmental engineering, mineral economics, anthropology, sustainability, environmental sociology, and public policy. And working together across all of these disciplines is not easy. Sometimes we have really, really tough conversations, very tense meetings, but we have put in a lot of time and effort to work smoothly as a team. We all really enjoy each other, and I think we know each other pretty well at this point, and that is a very important part of working across disciplines. You have to take the time and the effort to get to know each other and to get to know one another's disciplinary and personal viewpoints. Sometimes we miss that when we're rushed on projects. So we see that there are four potential modes of critical mineral supply, and all four will be needed to meet demand. Let's think about new main product mining operations, where a critical mineral is the main target, like Twin Metals in Minnesota. We're just starting a case study there, so I won't be able to share anything about that today, but hopefully in future. Um, also, Iron Creek in the Idaho Cobalt Belt, where cobalt is the main commodity of interest, and that is a critical mineral. Um, the second scenario is byproducts from existing mines. We're working on a case study on Carlin type deposits in Nevada, looking at byproduct recovery potential, and I'll share a little bit from that. Um, we're also open to new case studies on potential byproducts. 
And then the third is recovery from mine wastes. So I'll share some insights from Red Dog in Alaska. The fourth scenario is recycling, but as a geologist, I feel like that's a bit out of my expertise, so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, all four of these scenarios will be needed to meet demand, and my goal today is to demonstrate the importance of interdisciplinary assessment of the critical mineral potential at any site. So let's start with mine wastes and mine waste recovery of critical minerals, because I think this has really been coming up in conversation in science and in public policy lately. Um, and I think there are a lot of misconceptions and economic geologists have a really big role to play here. So um, there are a couple of different ways that we might look at mine waste recovery of critical minerals. The first example is where the critical mineral is the primary economic focus. So I just listened to a talk yesterday through SME on cobalt recovery from Mississippi Valley type tailings in the state of Missouri in the US. They're actually remediating the mine waste from historic MVT mining, recovering cobalt, and then they're going to go underground targeting cobalt. Um, the second kind of, of mine waste recovery situation might be where a byproduct that is a critical mineral is associated with and recovered alongside the same target that was previously um, same commodity that was previously targeted. So I'll give you um, an example in a couple of minutes on germanium associated with zinc in SEDx tailings, where zinc is still the principal commodity of interest, but germanium comes along with it. And then the third scenario is where a critical mineral is associated with a host mineral that would require novel processes to recover it economically. So for example, in porphyry copper deposits, tellurium can be hosted actually in pyrite as an impurity or as an inclusions in pyrite. And um, that might be in the tailings, but there are no simple off the shelf existing processes to recover tellurium from pyrite. So let's think about how you might choose a site if you're thinking about critical mineral recovery for mine from mine wastes. Selection criteria might include things like size, so ideally a large volume and high grade in the mine wastes, um, probably a prospective ore deposits type. So here's where we're using the USGS systems approach, um, and I'll talk to you about some of those data in a second. You also might want to consider the potential for net environmental benefit and whether the mine is historic or operating will certainly have very different constraints for potential production. So um, let's think about the USGS systems approach. I want to point everybody to this great database. Um, I've got the little image of the website right there. This is called the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative, and it's a collaborative um, effort between the USGS in the United States, Geoscience Australia, and the Geologic Survey of Canada where basically all the hand samples of ore deposits that were sitting around in cabinets or on people's desks were reanalyzed for 65 elements. And it's all compiled together in a GIS viewer. And you can look at it, you can download it. If you operate um, at a porphyry deposit, you can look at data on critical mineral inventory at porphyries from around the world. And it can give you some idea of what might be of interest at your deposit. So here's some work by one of our postdocs, Nina Zaranicola. She's looking at SEDx deposits from the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative um, a database. And so these are basically grab samples of ores from SEDx deposits around the world. And she's got the zinc and lead um, ratio here. You can see that um, possibly there's an inverse correlation between zinc and lead in these samples. If we think about what has been published, this is the figure on the right is called the Wheel of Companionality from Nadal Nasser's work. Um, and looking at zinc, there are some things that typically come along with zinc and ore forming systems, things like cadmium. So here's our zinc and cadmium correlation in these CMMI ore samples. And it looks like it's, you know, kind of a reasonable positive correlation with a few outliers. So if you're operating a zinc deposit, you have zinc assays, but you don't have cadmium assays, you might be able to use this to develop a relationship to understand how much cadmium you have. Although we don't want cadmium, it's normally considered a deleterious element. 
Let's look next at indium because it's also fairly close to zinc in the wheel, wheel of companionality. Indium and ZX deposits, mm, I don't think I can establish a correlation from this data set, although the data set is still rather small. Um, moving out on that circle, we can look at gallium and germanium. Gallium's on the left and germanium's on the right. Even in these hand samples from very well studied X deposits, where we think we ought to have um, germanium and gallium coming along with zinc, it's just scattered. Sorry, I think right. um, we lost a little, yeah, well, she is back, All right. <laughs> okay, yes. can I try sharing again? Yes, please, go ahead. Great. Uh, which desktop to share? I think I got the right one. Is that correct? Yes, uh, Elizabeth, I would ask if you may, maybe can turn off the video that might sort of, um, yeah. All right, let's give this a Great. try. I will probably try turning it back on in a couple of minutes and you can let me know if I need to turn it back off. Yeah, I think just, just yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so back to Red Dog. In 1989, Red Dog um, operations were developed through an agreement between Tech and the Alaska Native Corporation, NANA. They have a mine life that's planned until 2023. And Red Dog is mined by open pit, drill and blast with trucks and loaders. They produce a lead and zinc, separate lead and zinc concentrates, which are shipped to Tex smelter in Trail BC. So we're um, currently conducting a thought experiment to look at the potential of reprocessing tailings at Red Dog for critical mineral recovery. Of course, zinc is now on the US critical minerals list. So that counts for us, but we're looking at other things that might come along with zinc. So the annual flotation capacity at Red Dog is 1.10 million short tons of zinc concentrate um, per year. They generate 2.4 million short tons of tailings every year. And by the end of mining the current two pits, they are anticipating about 90 million short tons of tailings. So we've certainly got the large deposit going for us with a large volume of tailings. We know that the ZX environment is prospective for additional elements. We also know that this is a really challenging operating environment. It's 170 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. So our question here that we're answering using all of the academic disciplines that I showed you who are on the team is, can historically unrecovered zinc and lead and red dog tailings actually carry the cost of reprocessing and recovery of additional elements? So how do we go about figuring that out? Well, the easiest thing to start with is what is in the tailings that are being produced today. So we started with some analyses of off the line tailings. Those are tailings that are coming out right now, or I guess this was a couple of months ago. Um, and you can see there's, you know, up in the percents of barium and zinc, there is some antimony, a little bit of silver, copper, moly, arsenic, cobalt, we don't really see the gallium and the germanium and the indium in the tailings that are coming off the line right now. So we decided we need more than that. We're now working on semi-weekly off the line tailing samples, as well as flotation concentrates that were produced at site. And then we're hoping to do a sampling campaign this summer to do um, some hand augering at depth in the tailing storage facility to look at historic variation in tailings. We also are very fortunate to have access to historic zinc um, grades in the tailings since 1995. So that's helping us put together the picture of what might be left in the tailings now. 
Um, but starting with the off the line tailings, we're doing metallurgical testing on those. So Joe Troba, who's another one of our postdocs on our team, has done some flotation and he's generated a bulk sulfide flotation concentrate as well as a magnetic separation concentrate and a gravity separation concentrate. So we worked with Dr. Kata Faf at Colorado School of Mines to do automated mineralogy, locking and liberation analysis on that flotation concentrate. Um, you can see here that it is mostly made up of sphalerite and pyrite, a little bit of galena, barite, and rutile. So there's very little gain in the flotation concentrate that we generated from the tailings. That's really promising. It means with relatively simple methods, we're able to just recover the sulfides that we're interested in. Um, there's also very good particle liberation. The particle size is very small. That little scale bar there is only 50 microns. So most of the particles are smaller than that. And these are tailings that are coming out right now. Things that are in the tailing storage facility will be much more weathered. So we anticipate not the same mineralogy. Just taking a look at that particle size again, you can see P50 is the orange line. Um, that is only 11.9 microns and P80 is 14 microns, so we're pretty small here. Um, but overall, we were able to recover 33% sphalerite from a non-selective flotation. So this shows the potential for improved zinc recovery and possibly byproduct critical minerals that come along with the sphalerite. We need to do deportment studies next to figure out how much germanium is in sphalerite. And working with the tailings is difficult because the particle size is so small. So here's where you pull in your traditional economic geology and you look at the ore samples themselves. Um, we also think that gravity, gravity pre-concentration might increase the, the lead recovery as well as potential byproducts that come along with lead, like silver and possibly bismuth. So in order to understand this possibility holistically, we also need to look at the engineering and the economics. We need to do sampling that covers the X, Y, and Z dimensions, um, just like we would if we were delineating a traditional ore deposit. And that is not often done. I think um, grab sampling of mine waste is possibly going to lead people astray. Um, we're also working on mining methods and equipment selection, thinking about um, dredging or how you might actually recover this material and what the implications are of that small particle size. At the same time, we've got mining engineers on our team who are working on thinking about the stability and the longevity of the tailing storage facility if you were going to go remine it. And our goal is to produce a concept for a modified decommissioning plan. So stepping back a little bit from Red Dog specifically, I think this can help us think about some concerning misconceptions on mine waste recovery of critical minerals. So let's do some truth or fiction. There is critical mineral potential at all, at, in all mine waste. I would say that this is true. Critical minerals have gone recovered at every mine site, giving us a non-zero quantity of critical minerals because we have a non-zero quantity of critical minerals in every deposit. And very few mines recover those traditional byproduct elements such as tellurium, indium, gallium, and germanium. Um, historic tailings contain higher main product grades than today's mines. We hear this a lot, but I think it is likely fiction. We don't know until we have really good tailings inventory studies. We also hear the idea that historic tailings contain higher main product grades than today's tailings. Here we need to be careful. I think most mine sites probably have a period of low recovery during startup while the mill and all the metallurgical processes are being dialed in. That is maybe true at you know, probably most sites across the board. But the volume of that material is relatively small if the site has been operating for a long time. So you may have some higher grades deeper in your tailing storage facility, but that is not going to be representative of what you see throughout. We also often hear the idea that technological advances will enable better recovery than the recovery in the original mining. So if some zinc was lost and not recovered initially, there's the idea that we ought to be able to recover it from the tailings now. 
Well, here we need to operate with caution too. Have the recovery methods really changed that much? And for most common commodities and ore deposit styles that have been mined for a long time, probably not. We also need to consider that tailings material is really different from ore. So for example, the small particle size is challenging, but also represents embodied value because comminution has already happened and that energy and that money has already been spent to reduce the particle size. A few more truth or fiction questions. A lot of people have been thinking that yesterday's waste is today's ore because commodity prices have increased. I would say for most elements, this is fiction. So this picture on the right shows you inflation adjusted prices for copper, lead, zinc, and tin from 1910 until 2020. And you can see that although there's a lot of um, moving, movement around, overall prices are not that much higher when adjust, adjusted for inflation. This doesn't consider elements that we haven't really used much in the past, those um, critical mineral byproducts that are not in wide circulation right now. Um, so that is a separate thing that we are working on and thinking about. One more truth or fiction. The endowment can be calculated based on the main product to critical mineral ratio of ore. I think this is false. So this image on, at the bottom right is using the CMMI data um, for red dogs specifically, looking at zinc on the y-axis and germanium on the x-axis. And you cannot develop a correlation um, to determine using your zinc grades how much germanium is in the waste. This is going to require sampling of tailing storage facilities in x, y, and z space. So it's really important to remember that temporal variation and economic cutoff grades and differential interactions with the environment lead to spatially variable characteristics and grades within tailing storage facilities. So collecting a few grab samples is possibly a, a very misleading thing to do. So we need national inventory studies. Um, and they need to incorporate all of this careful sampling and also metallurgical and economic constraints, because seeing something exciting in an assay does not mean that it is easily recoverable from tailings material. So the key take home point here for critical mineral recovery from mine waste is that the constraints on byproduct recovery of critical minerals from mine waste are not the same as main product recovery of ores. So we can't think about, about them as being equivalent. We also need to think about the environmental, social, and governance context of critical mineral recovery from mine wastes. Do stakeholders value critical mineral production and are critical mineral related changes to the mine plan welcome? Not necessarily. It may open the door to other changes, which what we're hearing from stakeholders is that that's probably more of a concern than any excitement about critical minerals. We think that reprocessing of mine wastes during reclamation of historic waste would be the most responsible critical mineral supply scenario in terms of environmental and social justice. But I think this will rarely be technically, it may be technically feasible, but it will rarely be economically feasible unless there's policy intervention or subsidies to support that um, and change the economics. So before we go on to our next uh, topic, I'm gonna try turning on my video and hallelujah, just tell me if I need to turn it off, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll still advise you just keep it on because we sort of keep losing you now and then. So I think okay. just keep it, yeah. I'll just keep it on. Awesome. Thank you. All right. We are moving ahead then. Thank you. I think we're moving ahead. Yes, we are moving ahead. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, the next scenario that I want to talk to you about is byproduct critical mineral recovery from existing mining operations where critical minerals are currently going into waste and not being recovered. So let's think about carlin-type deposits in Nevada. Uh, I have been really excited about the science of carlin-type deposits and trying to figure out for the last eight years where the gold came from and looking at all these teeny tiny pyrite grains. And we thought, well, let's also look for critical minerals and talk about what it would take to recover them. 
we're looking at one of the highest throughput mining settings in the United States, 28 million tons of material are mined every year. So if you're looking for things that are low grade, high throughput is a good thing. It's also a very attractive mining destination and carlin type deposits are known for the association between gold and things like arsenic and antimony and other metals that currently go unrecovered. So I'm just going to share with you today publicly available data. We are working with MGM and Barrick on their own data um, and hope to come up with some recommendations for them and for their operations in a similar sort of thought experiment to what we're doing at Red Dog. But today I'll just show you what comes from the USGS database of ore samples. Um, this table considers silver, arsenic, gold, bismuth, mercury, antimony, tellurium, and thallium. Um, and we see that antimony and arsenic and tellurium and bismuth in particular are enriched far above crustal abundance in the ores. So that's the enrichment factor calculation for arsenic. There's 5,000 times more arsenic in carlin type ore than there is in the average crust. Um, there's also more antimony and arsenic um, and other, other things of interest than there is gold. So that's the element to gold ratio. So for arsenic, for example, there's 1,347 times more arsenic in ore than there is gold. However, the metal ratios vary widely by sample. So we have to be a little bit careful with how we extrapolate this. We also know from our micro scale studies of pyrite and, and the work that others have done on this that there are 18 elements that are above crustal abundance in the pyrite, most notably antimony and arsenic, um, and that there are some really important differences between diagenetic pyrite and nanoscale heterogeneous hydrothermal pyrite. But I think for the purposes of critical mineral inventory, um, as exciting as that science may be, it probably doesn't matter because all the pyrite is processed together. So let's think about the economics. Um, we're going to base our calculations based on tons mined in all Nevada gold mines operations in 2021, just using the numbers from the publicly available or sample data, which we extrapolate to that tonnage, looking at the mean PPM in the ores and then the amount that was mined and unrecovered in 2021, and we compare that to U.S. consumption in 2021 and compare that also to U.S. demand. So 40 times the amount of U.S. consumption of arsenic was mined and unrecovered in 2021. Um, the U.S. is also 100% net import reliant for arsenic. We have no stockpiles. It's used in semiconductors, space, telecommunications, et cetera. But there's only a very small market for high purity arsenic. If any single Carlin operation started recovering arsenic, it would produce more arsenic than the US needs, and by doing so, actually destroy the domestic market for arsenic. So this is um, not a straightforward thing to do. For antimony, there's also no US mine production. We do have one antimony smelter in Montana. Um, we could, if we recovered all the antimony in Carlin type ores each year, we could produce almost three times US consumption. And here there's an interesting opportunity for the US to become an antimony art, um, exporter because of demand in the EU. Also thinking about tellurium and bismuth, these are a little less straightforward. The amount um, that we could produce is fairly insignificant for, for bismuth. For tellurium, we could produce more than we import, which is interesting. Um, there's some domestic recovery from copper anodes, anode slimes, but that, that's it. Thinking about this from an engineering perspective, what would it take? Let's just do arsenic and antimony at first. They're unrecoverable from heat bleaching, basically. Pressure oxidation and the autoclaves, it's also hard to avoid iron precipitation. So it would be easiest from roasting and we suggest focusing on this stream. Um, the arsenic and antimony volatilize and they travel with the roaster off gas to the dust collection system. And I, we would think that they deport to the dust upon cooling. So that could represent a concentrated stream of, of material from which to recover arsenic or antimony if it was of interest. 
Bismuth and tellurium probably would not be easy to recover. Um, we are thinking about this for tellurium in particular. You know, there may be some intriguing possibilities, but there are basically no off-the-shelf technologies that would allow us to do this. We're also going to be addressing other elements that are outside of the ore zones, like cobalt and vanadium, which would require changes to the mine plan because those are areas that are not already mined um, since they're not really occurring in good correlation with the gold. So thinking about the ESG context of recovery of critical minerals as byproducts from Carlin type or other large operations, stakeholders have been supportive of other examples, for example, Kennecott recovering tellurium. Um, but it's unlikely to reverse public opposition if there's already a problem. So this isn't a way to casually greenwash a project by all of a sudden saying, we're gonna recover critical minerals too. If the public isn't happy with the operation in the first place, this isn't going to change the narrative, I think. Um, some lessons learned. Byproduct potential is limited by both geological and metallurgical enrichment factors. I know as geologists, we tend to see assay data and get really excited. And sometimes we need to temper that enthusiasm by having a conversation with a metallurgist, which may bring us quickly back to Earth. I was told by the metallurgist on our team that recovering tellurium from carlin type deposits is about as efficient as recovering iron from the dirt in my backyard. So um, we need to be thinking about that context too. I think the economics are always going to be challenging and there's both a need and an opportunity for policy intervention here. Uh, this is certainly a responsible thing to consider and investigate and I think we'll be seeing a lot of conversation about it. Um, and I would like it to be based on careful geological and metallurgical thinking. So for my last case study, let's talk about new main product critical mineral mines. Here I'm going to take us to the Idaho Cobalt Belt in the United States, which is really an exciting exploration area, um, has a lot of promise for main product cobalt recovery. There are 45 known occurrences of cobalt and copper and some gold in the southwest portion of the Belt Purcell Basin, and the copper occurs as chalcopyrite. The cobalt occurs as cobaltite at some deposits, cobalt-bearing arsenopyrite at others, and cobalt-bearing pyrite at Iron Creek, where we're going to focus. So at Iron Creek, the electrobattery materials has developed an underground mining scenario with 2.2 million tons at 0.32% cobalt equivalent. So that's 12.3 million pounds of cobalt and 29 million pounds of copper. There's also an inferred resource. Um, ore is hosted primarily in the um, Apple Creek formation. And you can see some examples here of drill core. The upper sample is cobalt ore, and the lower is cobalt and copper ore. So we did some careful investigation of the ore minerals to try to think about what recovery would look like and, and how this relates to the story of responsible critical mineral production in the United States. The samples that we looked at were up to 67% pyrite. The chalcopyrite varies depending on whether you're in the cobalt zone or the cobalt copper zone, up to 28% chalcopyrite. And where these minerals occur together, they're intergrown. The cobalt or the chalcopyrite actually even includes pyrite inclusions. So if you look at image D, for example, the orange is chalcopyrite, and you can see it's got little grains of pyrite, the yellow, inside along fractures and disseminated near the margins and so forth. There's also um, a mineral, the cadiorite basite salt solution series, which is a cobalt nickel sulfide, and those are the red in these automated mineralogy images, um, and that's up to 2%. We also have the typical gang minerals associated with this deposit style. So the images on the right um, are cobalt and cobalt copper maps. The cobalt is red and the copper is blue. Um, the pyrite itself is the main host for the cobalt at this deposit. The pyrite can be up to six weak percent cobalt. And there's also minor nickel in the cobalt poor zones of the pyrite. Cobalt is in minor cadiorite basite as well, and the chalcopyrite is cobalt poor. So taking a look at this um, 
deposit model on the top left of the screen, you can see there are two zones. There's a shallow um, red copper rich ore zone and a, um, the blue, blue ore zone is cobalt rich. So we also looked in detail at the pyrite for other trace elements and it hosts lots of things besides the cobalt. It can host some um, copper, bismuth, lead, tellurium, selenium, silver, gold, and antimony. The chalcopyrite hosts a different suite of trace elements, including zinc and, and also some silver and some indium. So the images on the left are from the cobalt ore zone and the images on the right are from the cobalt copper ore zone. We don't show you any chalcopyrite. These are all just pyrite. So this is very exciting. I love this mineralogy and we're doing all kinds of things with this. We're doing um, copper and zinc isotope studies with Ryan Mather right now, I'm trying to figure out what this all means for deposit formation. But what does it mean for critical mineral production? Let's put our interdisciplinary view, um, our interdisciplinary glasses back on and think about the engineering. So remember that the chalcopyrite and the pyrite are intergrown in the places where they occur together. Well, could you float a chalcopyrite pyrite sulfide concentrate for smelting? Well, no smelter in the US can re recover cobalt. Combined cobalt copper smelters elsewhere in the world are not designed for pyrite. It would generate too much SO2 and limit the, the throughput. And you also can't recover the indium or the zinc from the chalcopyrite. So imagine if we could wave a magic wand and build a very expensive smelter and that everybody would be excited about that. Um, there's potential for a purpose-built combined cobalt copper smelter in the Idaho Cobalt Belt for all of these deposits. If there's no purpose-built smelter, you could mine the copper zone separately and send the chalcopyrite to a U.S. copper smelter. Your cobalt ore, you would have to ship um, there. Uh, there's a hydromet facility currently under construction in Missouri, and Electra Battery Materials owns one that they're refurbishing in Ontario. Uh, the only company that's currently recovering cobalt from the Idaho Cobalt Belt is sending it to a hydromet plant in Brazil. Um, if you were thinking about mining the zone where both copper and cobalt occur together, if you ideally removed all the chalcopyrite, you could upgrade the, concentra the concentration of cobalt of that concentrate to 5% cobalt, which would reduce your shipping weight. Um, but this, if you recall the textures, I think we can go back to our little cartoon here and remember how intergrown these are. Full liberation of the pyrite from the chalcopyrite in that shared copper cobalt ore zone is gonna be really difficult. Thinking about byproduct recovery, um, if you sent the pyrite for hydrometallurgical processing, you could recover the cobalt and the nickel. But the silver, arsenic, bismuth, lead, antimony, tellurium, and gold in the pyrite would go to waste. These little inclusions that occur in the pyrite, if you could do a really, really fine grind and then maybe float them out somehow, you might be able to send them to a precious metals processor. Otherwise, they're going to go to waste. The chalcopyrite, if you could fully separate that from the pyrite, you could send it to a smelter, but everything that's in the chalcopyrite besides the copper would probably go to waste, as would those little pyrite inclusions that are cobalt bearing that are sitting in the chalcopyrite. So this is really not easy from a technical perspective, and I applaud all of the companies that are working really hard on this. Um, I think that this shows you the importance of of geometallurgy, really meaning the geology and the metallurgy together, um, and both groups putting their heads together and figuring out how we're gonna be able to do this. From an ESG perspective, there's a potential for federal subsidies for byproduct recovery, um, and that requires metallurgical R&D. Think about the fact that economics really favor optimal but not maximal metal recoveries. So a lot of our metals that we mine do go to waste. Um, one of the things that we're working on starting this spring is we're aiming to convene a local mining association. So we're hoping to have a meeting in April and have any company that's working in the area come join us and talk about what might be some of the synergies that we could explore for having these companies work together. 
Um, I also think one of the big questions in new development of any mine is who counts as a stakeholder? And does criticality of the targeted commodity make it different to most stakeholders? I would suggest that right now it doesn't. So we have to be careful of sort of overhyping that, I think. Um, from an economic perspective, the total metal content of the Idaho cobalt belt is undefined. But if all of the cobalt at Iron Creek in the indicated resource could be recovered, it only covers 10 months of current domestic demand in the United States and less than two months of projected cobalt demand in 2050. So I think this tells us that there's no single deposit and no single district that can easily answer our critical mineral problems. We're gonna need a combined solution of new main product operations, byproduct recovery and recovery from mine wastes. We also need to think about bolstering our stockpiles. Key points from new main product critical mineral operations. Um, geological characteristics lead us to engineering constraints, which then affect how we would design a mine, and that leads to public perception. I also think there's the danger of hype. We get really excited about critical minerals, but for your average person who's thinking about having a mine in their backyard, that may not make the difference. And then lastly, I just want to encourage everybody to integrate all disciplines together, um, especially in places like the Idaho Cobalt Belt, where by bringing in an interdisciplinary perspective, I think we can be more careful about how we might seek public approval. So some thoughts to close. What can we do? I think the energy transition is going to intensify the crisis that's brewing for the mining sector. The world needs our raw materials, but increasingly finds that the way that we provide them is unacceptable. So the flip side of that is this is our opportunity to change. First, we need to look at all mine development, not just critical mineral development, from an interdisciplinary framework. Everybody from all these different disciplines needs to be working together, which can be really hard to do. It can be hard to get all those people together in a room. It can be hard to understand what we're all talking about, but we need to put in that effort. We also have to stop greenwashing. The energy transition cannot just be more of the same old way of doing things, but saying, yay, this is going to help us limit the effects of climate change. We need to come up with new ways of doing things and change our approach to project development. So social license can't be transactional. We need to think of everybody as a stakeholder in the energy transition. We're all stakeholders in every mine. And environmental NGOs aren't the enemy, they're the sign of the times and they're a sign of what people care about. Collaboration and working together is a better approach. We also need to move to models that enable stakeholders to choose where their raw materials come from. So partnerships with Alaska Native Corporations is one example. And mining companies need to be partnering with battery makers and, and everyone who's using the downstream products and the NGOs to develop projects that stakeholders are comfortable with from start to finish. So I think we have a huge opportunity before us. I hope I've motivated you to think about this from an interdisciplinary perspective. And I really appreciate your time. Thanks for listening. And I would be happy to answer any questions now or feel free to contact me in the future. Thanks, Elizabeth, for that interesting talk. Uh, and uh, we have about 10 minutes for our uh, discussion. So please feel free to uh, put your question in the Q&A box and I will be sure to pass it on to Elizabeth. Um, important points there on your closing thoughts about interdisciplinary. Um, and I think that's really important and it's something that I've observed doesn't really happen, although now it's starting to be factored into a lot of projects, especially exploration and mining. I think we need to do that because at times you sort of get questions from mining to sort of say, well, you told us 10% zinc and now we are only recovering, especially like metallurgy, we're only recovering 7%. What happened to the other 3%? So working, I think, from the beginning, integrating exploration, mining and metallurgy is really important. So let me, there is a question for you, Elizabeth. It says, nice presentation. Uh, does antimony require difficult and expensive extraction processes? And I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear. Was it antimony? Yeah. 
Well, that's something that we're working on right now. And um, I'm not a metallurgist, so I can't answer in detail. But I think the important thing to think about if we're looking at antimony targets is geological enrichment plus metallurgical enrichment. When we're talking about recovery of a potential byproduct, um, the economics get very steep very quickly if we have to introduce additional circuits or other types of processing that do not simultaneously improve recovery of the main product. If we can, for example, recover antimony by also improving our gold recovery or by adding just a very small additional piece to the circuit, then it's going to be much more likely. Great, thank you. And yes, I'm actually looking forward to some of the work that you're doing and just sort of um, see how that pans out. And for anyone interested, um, I know a team in ICREG or Link Lizzo, she was part of the audience, they actually did or did some similar work looking at the uh, critical results in the Irish and zinc failings and all. So it is good to see that a lot of um, this work is being done and uh, we're testing the economics and the concentration of these uh, metals, thin our ores and tailings. I'm happy to hear that because I was up late last night doing a comparison of Irish type um, ores to SEDx ores and looking at critical elements that are in common and not. So I would be happy to chat further with anybody that's interested. Great. great. Um, going back to the Q&A, there's another question for you here. Uh, <laughs> um, the question says, how early should geometallurgists in get involved in projects? And uh, the follow-up question is, are the geometallurgy classes enough for exploration geologists? Well, thanks for the question, Cry. I'm glad to hear that you're here. Um, we can have lots of conversations about this in the future. Um, I, I think it's really hard for me to say as an academic that geomet should come at the very beginning because it's expensive. You know, going out, collecting the kinds of representative samples that we need, looking at them using sophisticated high spatial resolution analytical techniques, being able to go back and forth, toggle between those data and metallurgical testing. That's not something that would make sense to do in the very early stages of, say, a, a, you know, a junior exploration project. But at the same time, if we leave it until too late, we run the risk of exploring for deposits that may have some fatal flaws. Um, and I think that we don't necessarily see all the potential that our deposits may have, particularly if we're talking about opportunities for byproduct credits. So it's going to be a different answer for every company. Um, partnering with academic organizations that can do this because we have the instrumentation and we also have the ability to work across disciplinary barriers very early on before, say, a junior company might even have an established relationship with the metallurgist. That's one way to do it. Um, I don't I don't have a full sense of what's being taught in geometallurgy classes across the world. But I do, my impression is that those are often really taught by geoscientists who are very adept at the microanalytical techniques that um, help us gather geometallurgical data. But I don't think that the metallurgical voice is often in the class as much as it probably needs to be. So that falls on all of us, um, especially in academic institutions, to be able to work across those departmental and disciplinary divides more closely. Thank you. Uh, we do not have, well, let's see if that question's coming up. We have, well, there's a question from Don. Um, and if, if it's not currently practical to recover critical metals from the byproducts of existing or plant mines, are there certain tailings or waste management methods that we that would make it easier to recover metals in the future should the metallurgy or processing capacity change? If you can just briefly touch on that, Elizabeth. I'm so glad to hear you ask that, Don, because we're drafting a paper right now talking about what assessment methods might even need to be part of regular mining practice. 
so that later when we have the tailings, if economics change, if the suite of elements of interest change, that it's easier to go back. If we don't have the data, it's impossible to go back. Um, the mining engineers on our team are actually thinking about mining methods and mine waste storage methods right now and, and trying to do a comparison. I don't have an answer for you yet on which um, storage methods might be easier. You know, is it easier to go back and do a dry stack or a TSF? Um, but maybe get in touch with me in a year and see if we have anything on that. We're thinking about it for sure. Great. And then the last question, um, it's, it's a follow-up. It's a follow-up on the geomet question. So the question is, um, part of what we offer as a geological survey is pretty competitive data. From this lens, is there a role for service to play in the geomet piece? Jumping on this question. Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, I've had some really fantastic conversations with the US Geological Survey recently. And they really, since we no longer have a Bureau of Mines in the United States, I think they're really missing that metallurgical input. And so Joe Troba, our metallurgy postdoc, gets, tends to get pulled into those conversations all the time because he has things in his head that are so obvious to him um, that are really helpful. I guess I'm I'm unsure to what extent sort of the high spe spatial resolution analyses that we geologists traditionally do as part of GeoMet. I, I don't know yet how important that's going to be to record. I think um, some of that is really expensive and really deposit specific, may not even be deposit type specific, but I think that to the extent that surveys can help generate these data and maybe geologic surveys should have some metallurgists. Um, that, that would be a really valuable thing, I think. Thank you for that. And again, thanks, um, Elizabeth, for Holly, for the interesting um, presentation. And um, yes, looking forward to hearing more of your work thanks. and the outcome of your current case studies that you guys are with. All right. Uh, we're moving on to our last speaker, last speaker, but that does not mean the least. Uh, our last speaker is uh, Caroline Perrin, who is a 2022 Regional Vice President Lecturer. Caroline was educated at Cambridge University and the Royal School of Mines, but has spent most of her career working in the Sea and Yukon Creighton of Western Australia. She completed a PhD at the University of Western Australia in the field of mesothermal called mineralization before joining the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. Apart from a brief stint at James Cook University where she worked on iron oxide copper gold deposits, she spent the next 25 years studying magmatic nickel copper sulfide mineralization in commodity at Volcanism, likely with Western Mining Corporation and then PhD Billet and Nicole West. She is now a principal geologist with PHP's Western Australian Iron Ore Division. Next slide, please. Caroline's talk is entitled A New Genetic Model for Beef Hosted Meritite Gothite Ores of the Hamelsey Province. Welcome, Caroline. Please, um, the next 45 minutes are yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, hallelujah, and uh, good morning, everyone, or perhaps it's good evening for you. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, does that look every look okay to you? Oh, yes, if you can just please put it in. Yes, looks great. Thank you. Yeah, lovely. Okay, so what I'd like to do this, uh, th this evening or this morning is to take you through a new genetic model that we've developed for banded iron formation hosted martite girthite ores based on our um, iron ore, ore tenements in the Hammersley province of Western Australia. I should take this opportunity to uh, recognize my co-authors, uh, John Hronsky and Nat Crow, and also the hundreds of company geologists um, without whose geological interpretation and, and work the underlying analysis that, that lies behind this new model, it just would not have been possible. So, as you may or may not know, Western Australia is one of the world's greatest producers, largest producers of, of high-grade iron ore. And by high-grade, I mean 
61 to 62% iron in the, in the natural product. Um, WA produces about 900 million tonnes of ore per, per annum. And um, this actually is derived from three completely different types of, of, of iron ore mineralization, three completely different genetic types. These I've illustrated here. Sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of some other stuff on my screen. Um, so these types of ore are illustrated in, in photo, photographs on the right here. The oldest is the martite microclady type of, of, of ore, which we abbreviate to M and PLH. Um, this is hypogene, it's paleoproterozoic in age, it's very, very hematite rich and represents the, the, the purest, uh, highest grade material that we mine. And I'll pick up a laser pointer. So this top left hand diagram here is a hand specimen of high grade ore from Mount Whaleback Mine. Um, this can gr grade up to 67 to 68% iron, so it's almost pure hematite. The next uh, type of ore that we mine is the martite girthite ore, and this is what I'll be speaking about mainly today. It's supergene in origin. It's also very, very much younger, so it's Eocene to Oligocene in age. And there's a lovely uh, outcrop photograph in the top right here. This is supergene or the, the chocolate brown material is martite. Now, martite just means hematite that is pseudomorphing the original magnetite in the ores. And you can still see the original um, sedimentary bedding. It's, it's, it's quite tightly folded here. And these yellowy mustard colored bands, these are the original gang layers in the, in the primary biff, and they've been converted to girthite rich material. Hence the term martite, girthite ores. Our third main type of mineralization is known as CID or channel iron deposit mineralization. These are essentially fluviatile piezolytic uh, sedimentary accumulations. There's a hand photograph on the bottom left here. You can see the little piezolites. They're sort of sand, sandy sized grains. And uh, diagnostically, there are little tiny fragments of fossilized wood. These piezolites have hematite cores, girthite uh, cortices, and they've been cemented, perhaps originally by siderite, but, but the cement today is mainly a mixture of girthite and um, chalcedonic silica. Now, there is actually quite a little bit of complexity because the, the supergene style of mineralization can overprint the original hypergene style, so you can get these hybrid deposits. And then on top of everything, there is, has been a strong lateritic overprint affecting the top, typically the top 50 meters uh, of, of material. Uh, producing what we call lateral hard cap. There's a photograph shown here in the bottom right. This uh, weathering process typically destroys the original um, banding in the rock and it introduces a lot of porosity. It also tends to uh, reduce, the, uh, reduce the iron content of the rock somewhat and increase, uh, increase the variability of the grade. So we have to get through this hard and slightly lower grade material before we can uh, get into the, the fresher ores. And this affects all three types of, of, of primary mineralization. The Hammersley province of, of Western Australia is, is, is a vast and very, very uh, iron enriched um, portion of the globe. We still have in resource, even though the industry has been going for, for about 50, 50 years, we still have in resource over 70 gigatons of high grade iron. In the past, the, the industry was um, started out based on the big hypergene pure deposits of Mount Tom Price and Mount Whaleback. These ores are gradually being depleted and we're relying more heavily and will do in the future on the martite girthite style of mineralization. And this really was the, the main driver behind the, the, the study that, that produced this, this new genetic model. Most of our ores are what are called direct shipping ores. Uh, this means that they are so high grade grades are around 60 to 62 percent iron. They're so high grade that we, we don't need to beneficiate them or, or probably only 10 to 20 percent of the ore is beneficiated. We produce two products. One is a lump product. That's material where the, the grains are greater than 6.3 millimeters and a fines product. And these products are then shipped directly to our customers around the world, mostly uh, steel mills. So because this material is, is direct shipping, um, there's no beneficiation essentially, it's important that we keep both the chemical composition and the physical properties of our ores within the tolerance for our customers. 
And this is where orgenesis comes in. It, basically, the orgenesis determines not only the mineral composition and the chemical composition of the rock, because there are some variations between the different types, it also controls the, the, the texture of the mineral grains, the way in which they interlock, and this in turn influences the hardness of the rock and the way that it breaks when it's mined and transported. And of course, this then impacts the, the lump to fine ratio of our product. So even though this is a bulk commodity and many people may think of, uh, of iron ore as a, as a fairly geologically dull um, type of uh, commodity, Actually, the geology is extraordinarily important, um, and all genesis particularly so. So to introduce you to the Hammersley province, I'm talking to you this morning from Perth in, in the southwest of Western Australia. The Hammersley province sits up here, about two thirds of the way up through the state. It's a two hour flight from, from Perth. The Hammersley province sits on the southern flank of the Pilbara Craton. The Pil Pilbara Craton is shown in this pale pink color here. The rocks that we're really interested in, the banded iron formations that form the host to the mineralization, are, are part of the Hammersley group shown here in this dark chocolate brown. This uh, is a two and a half kilometer thick sequence of basinal sediments that are archaean to Paleoproterozoic in age. Uh, they rest conformably on, on the um, shaley and basaltic rocks of the Fortescue province shown in green. Um, and the stratigraphic column here in the, in the middle illustrates the makeup of the Hammersley group. So at the bottom, you'll see the Maramamba iron formation. This is one of the two main iron formations that we mine. The other one is the Brockman iron formation here in the center of the stratigraphic column. And this is made up of two main members, the Joffre and the Dales Gorge, shown in pink and red. There is another iron formation at the top of the sequence called the Bulgida iron formation but this rarely hosts um, a mineralization of economic quantity. Separating the Maramamba from the Bob Brockman is a sequence of dominantly dolomite-dominated sedimentary rocks of the Whitloom Formation, and separating the Brockman from the Bulgida is a sequence of uh, bimodal volcanic and, and volcanoclastic rocks of the Ungara Large Igneous Province. Now, the area on which this, this study concentrated was, was the, the, the New South Flank Mining Hub. This is part of um, a, a previous mining area called Mining Area C in the central part of the Hammersley Basin. And the, the, the mines here are dominate, dominantly hosted within the Maramamba Formation. So I just want to quickly um, expand the stratigraphic column for the Maramamba Iron Formation, shown here on the right. So there are three main subunits shown in dark blue, mid blue, and these sort of yellowy ochreous colors, the um, Namaldi, McLeod, and Mount Newman member. The uppermost member, the Mount Newman, is the one that hosts most of our mineralization. And we subdivide it informally into three further units, which you'll see on some of the cross sections, N1, 2, and 3. There is also some mineralization associated with the basal unit of the overlying Whitman formation. This is a, a car, a, fairly carbonate rich unit uh, where fresh, but it can be mineralized um, and it will also appear in some of my cross sections. Moving now to look at the camp scale geology. This is a map view of the mining area C. Uh, essentially the south flank mines are situated in, along the southern flank of this, this large east-west trending doubly plunging anticline. We also have mines along the north flank and in fact, there are additional mines in the Pack Saddle Range here to the north. So essentially, the core of this big anticline, the Wheelie Wally anticline, is, uh, comprises outcrop of the Maramamba Iron Formation. So the, the, the darker and pale blue colors and the olive green, those are all members of the Maramamba Iron Formation. The one that's most of most critical importance for our mining is the Mount Newman member in the olive green colors, color. Um, to the north and south of the Wheelie Wally anticline are remnants of our, uh, the Brockman Iron Formation. There's a synclinal keel here forming a range uh, of high hills to the south. And then to the north, the pack saddle uh, deposits sit along the, the edge of a, a broad open syncline to the north. And separating the Thiar formations are the, uh, is the Whitnoon formation, but it's been karstically eroded and the intervening valleys, these east-west valleys, 
journey in the, in the pale sort of beige colour. They're now infilled with a variety of sediments of, of, of basically Mesozoic to Cenozoic age. I've also shown, um, so the, the red outlines are our project areas and in dark, the, the black dotted lines basically mark the position of a, an older phase of mesoscale synclines, which are very, very important to all formation, as I'll, come, as, as I'll explain. These synclinal structures tend to host the base, best mineralization, and I've outlined them here. You can see there's a, a number of them on the northern and southern flanks of the, the broader Wheelie Wally Dome. And most of the mineralization is, is associated with, with these areas. The, the mineralization is the hatched, um, shows a hatched um, coloration. Just to look at the structural setting in a little bit more detail, I've got a cartoon on the left here. As I said, there are these mesoscale north verging folds, which are basically the oldest type of folding recognized in the area. Very often the, the steep north facing limbs have been um, thrust, dislocated by, by small thrusts as a result of, uh, of over tightening of those limbs. And then a second generation of regional folds, which produces that, that, very, re that very obvious regional um, anticlinal outcrop pattern. This is a later scale stage of large regional scale open folding. And what you will find clearly these, these mesoscale folds are older. They're not parasitic on this regional anticline because they're north verging both on the south flank and on the, on the north flank. There is a third generation of folding, which is, uh, has axial planes broadly trending north south, very, very um, open large amplitude folds. And these folds are responsible for um, creating some of the sin sinuosity that you see in those um, in the shape and the dis distribution of those synclinal keels. You can see that sin sinuosity in plan view on this map to the right. So the synclinal keels are in black. They're overlaid on an iron meters, um, bedrock iron meters map. This is basically a way of collapsing 3D information into, into two dimensions. It's essentially the sum of the grade multiplied by the intercept of the mineralization. And what you can see, so the red color, colors are, are the better grade intercepts. What you can see is that the, the, the better grades are, do tend to be associated with these synclinal keel positions. And as I said, the, 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 the keels are sinuous both in a sort of north-south sense, but they're also sinuous in a, in a vertical plane as well as a result of that very last generation of folding. So many of these keels have a significant plunge on them. And it looks as though they're acting as gutters and focusing the ore fluids. Um, and this is one of the factors that results in, in them being so well mineralized. A lot of this work was based on a, a regional scale 3D um, geological stu modeling study, essentially using 3D software to synthesize our enormous data set of, of, of drill data, plus the 2D data sets of um, you know, geophysical, airborne geophysical data, mapping data, um, and um, surface sampling. So given that we were looking at a, at, a, at a regional scale 3D model, there's a lot that we can learn from deposit morphology about what is controlling the flow of all fluids. And I've got a couple of cross sections here on the right. I want to start looking at the, the one at the top, which is from Grand Central on that southern limb of the Wheelie Wally anticline. North is to your right. Take this part of the ore body at, at the southern side, and you can see there's quite the, 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 the ore is shown in, in red um, as a red overlay on top of the, uh, the, the stratigraphic interpretation. So I've just got lines here for the top of the, the different stratigraphic units. So the, the ore is, is basically hosted within the Mount Newman member of the Maramambaran formation. There's a nice thick um, intercept of mineralization near surface where bedding dips are at about 35 to 40 degrees. But you can see that as the, the bedding dips um, decrease with depth to they start to flatten off, the mineralization thins very, very dramatically. And whilst it does continue down, down dip for several hundred meters, it, is, it basically is attenuated to such thin, um, thin intercepts that it's no longer economically viable. Contrast that southern um, cross-sectional view with what's going on on the north side of this, this mesoscale anticline. And syncline pair. On the, the northern limb, you've got a nice consistent steep dip of about 45 degrees 
um, heading down probably about um, 300 meters down, down dip. And as you can see, the almost the entire thickness of that um, Mount Newman member is mineralized down to, to significant depths. At this point here, there's a little um, um, parasitic anticline syncline pair developed. And as a result of that dip reversal, the mineralization starts to finger into finger and, and peters out over about 100 meters uh, further down dip. So we can see here very clearly the, the role that bedding dip has, and particularly dip reversal, on controlling all fluid flow. Now, in addition to the bedding plane um, permeability, there's also structurally enhanced permeability and the effect of, of, of thrust that we have to take into account. In this particular cross section, you can see these flat line thrusts. This one has actually brought um, the original Mount Newman banded iron, <coughs> banded iron formation into thrust contact with underlying West Angeles material, which is quite shale rich um, and acts pretty much as an aquitard. And what you can see here is that the, the ore fluids have mineralized the, the Mount Newman member on the, on the uh, upper side of that fault plane, but the fault plane itself acts as a, an aquacluid or an aquitard, and mineralization is terminated along that fault plane. <clears throat> Um, moving now to the cross sections at the bottom here, these are these are both from the northern side of the Wheelie Wally anticline from the from the north flank mining area. Once again, um, and, and north is again to your right. Once again, you can see these uh, thrust here that has brought Mount Newman member banded iron formation into contact with Shaley West Angelum uh, formation. And again, the mineralization, the the ore, the banded iron formation is well mineralized above that thrust plane, but the plane itself acts as an aquatard and there's, there's no mineralization developed underneath it. Despite the fact that you've got a nice synclinal keel here, you, you might expect that to be well mineralized. Contrast this view with the, the one on the right here. Here we have a, a dolerite dike coming through. And so there is vertically oriented structural permeability associated with that dike contact. And what this has done, it's allowed the ore fluids to come down. That's that structural permeability from surface and to mineralize the um, synclinal keel beneath this thrust plane um, via a completely different fluid pathway. So fluids coming down through the banded iron formation from the top left here um, have mineralized the, the, the iron formation above this thrust plane that have not been able to pass through it. However, these other fluids put, traveling down the, the structural, in, structurally induced permeability have have met, had, had access to that synclinal keel. And you'll notice there's better mineralization developed right here in the keel. And that is a result also of structurally induced um, axial folial um, planar, planar cleavage, basically. That's increased the, the, the permeability um, of the fold hinge itself, and you get much better mineralization developed in that particular zone. It is, of course, always important to realize that, the, that you're dealing with a three-dimensional system. So it's important to, to, to have context as to what is in front of and behind that section. Very often um, you can find off what looks like orphan pat patches of mineralization in the cross section in a keel position, but then you realize that that, that mineralization is, is actually connected all the way through surface up plunge of that, that synclinal keel. So to sum up, the, the bedding dip matters. Um, basically, if the dip is less than about 10 degrees, you're unlikely to produce economic thicknesses of mineralization, thicknesses and grades. It's important to consider the role of aquitards. So if, um, if you have a flat line thrust that brings banded iron formation on top of a more shale unit, that's likely to terminate the mineralization. And we can see basically from, from first principles, from, from studying the shapes of these ore bodies, we can see quite clearly that the, the permeability, permeability um, the, the, the ore fluids are controlled by both bedding parallel permeability and by structurally generated permeability. And it's clearly a top-down system. All the mineralization, we can, we can link it up to surface um, via um, likely fluid pathways. Now we can also say something about the, the ore forming process from the compositional variation of the deposits, i.e. from the deposit zonation. This is another cross section um, from the northern side of the Wheelie Wally anticline from the north flank, um, one of the north flank deposits called sea deposit. Again, north is to your right. And what we have here is um, the Maramambaran formation, 
the West Angeles um, formation, and then these are overlying um, Mesozoic and Cenozoic sediments which above the, the ore. Um, what you'll notice is that the I've, I've colored the ore, it's distinctly compositionally zoned into, into several different categories here. The main high grade, the best high grade ore is shown here in pink. This material is essentially supergene mineralization after original banded iron formation. What you will notice also is that there is this pale green zone that typically forms the base of the ore body and the down, down dip extremities. This is siliceous mineralization. And what vitrography tells us is this is essentially parts of the banded iron formation where mineralization has not gone to completion. You've still got relict quartz from the parent banded iron formation preserved. And that's why this ore is siliceous. It's actually, actually ore is a mis misleading term. Generally, we do not mine this stuff because the silica content is too high. Contrasting the ores developed within the banded iron formation with the overlying mineralization in the West Angeles unit. Now remember, this does have some iron formation in it, but it's, it's a more carbonate and shale rich unit um, where fresh. Occasionally it will produce ore. Um, shown here in purple, but this is quite a luminous ore, reflecting the original shale content of that, of the, of that West Angeles member. Down dip of material that actually runs ore grade. What we see are these manganiferous and ferruginous shales shown in pale blue. Again, that's basically the, the, the downflow side of the ore system. It's not, it's not ore grade, but you're, you're still seeing dissolution of carbonate and enrichment of um, manganese and iron as a result. And it's not until you go quite a long way down dip that you find fresh carbonate bearing West Angeles member material. And then over printed on top of that are the effects of laterative weathering. These, this dashed yellow line here essentially is the base of the, the, the weathering profile. And again, you, get, you, can, you can still see through that weathering profile, even though it does somewhat disturb the grades, it makes the iron grades lower and more variable. You can still see the, the, the um, the distrib distribution of the original high-grade biff hosted ore, which was basically derived from this pink material, contrasted with this uh, ochre-colored material, which was originally derived from the aluminous um, primary ore. So even within the lateritic weathering profile, you can still see um, relics of the original uh, sedimentary bedding and the ore that was derived from that, those, those sedimentary precursors. So to kind of summarize the fluid flow in these supergene ore systems, the source of the fluid, uh, like most supergene systems, is basically meteoric um, rainfall. Meteoric runoff is controlled by the paleotopography, which in turn is very strongly controlled by the bedrock structure. Um, essentially, that, that broad um, dome of the Wheelie Wally anticline, which is caused by Maramamba and iron formation, that forms in, in, in reality, a, a low um, domal um, outcrop, so that the, the, the underlying bedrock structure is reflected in the current topology of the topography of the, of the land surface. The recharge of the, uh, of the system, basically ground water recharge, is focused by subvertical structures. Um, and we can see how, how this is affecting the, the overall development of the, the ores and the, the better grades at depth. The fluid pathway, as I hope I've explained through those, illustrated in those cross sections, it basically tells us that the, that the, um, the main sources of uh, permeability that are important for this type of ore formation are, in the first instance, stratigraphic. So this is bedding par parallel permeability in these highly banded um, sedimentary rocks. And secondary of, of secondary significance is the structural permeability. This is permeability that has been introduced as a result of um, vertical faults and subvertical vertical um, joint sets, axial planar foliage, things like that. It's important to point out that these, these uh, structural elements were all, uh, are all pa uh, Paleozoic in age, so the structural architecture far, um, is, is far older than the actual supergene uh, or forming system itself. And the main fluid driver, of course, is, is gravity. Um, this is, is it, it, this could be seen in the in the in the influence on on bedding plane dip and bedding plane morphology on the shape of your bodies, 
And of course, there's also a factor relating to the hydrological head or the shape of the water table. There is actually a, a, a set of springs at the eastern side of this project area. Um, so the water table dips gently from, from, the, from the northwest to the, to the southeast. The diagram here on the right, what I've shown here is the top of the N2 unit. So this is one of the um, sub-member units within the Mount Newman R information. And it is uh, well within the ore body of uh, um, across the, the entire Hammersley, uh, sorry, the entire Wheelie Wally anticline. So what I've done is shown, the, shown you the shape of this, this bedding plane surface being illustrative of, of, of the shape of, of, the, of the bedding planes within the ore body. I've contoured it and I've colored it by gray scale so that you can see that the very steeply dipping north, southern and northern flanks of the Wheelie Wally anticline. You can see the core of the anticline sitting about here and the much more gentle dips of the, 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 the lovely plunging dips to the, to the west and to the east. And because the ore fluid flow is, is primarily controlled by the shape of the bedding plane, we can almost treat this, this uh, bedding plane surface as you would a topographic surface. So we can basically divide it up into a number of catchments, if you like, using my, using my um, topographic analogy. And what we see here, essentially, there are five different cat catchments or five different ore forming systems associated with this dome. North flank, south flank, this internal catchment associated with a synclinal valley, um, the R deposit valley and the highway valley. The colored worms are essentially the synclinal keels and the color, colors relate to the RL of those keels. So red is high, this keel is plunging off to the northwest. Uh, blue is low and you can see in the syncline valley, there's a, there's, there's a significant plunge on this keel to, to the deepest point around here and then it trends up towards surface again. So I think this view illustrates that there is a significant plunge on these keels and that's why they tend to act as gutters and focus fluid flow. And what you can do is a, a back of the, the envelope calculation, looking at the amount of ore um, defined within these different uh, catchment areas. You can make some assumptions about how much iron or has, how much fit has been eroded um, since the, the formation of these, these deposits about 45 million years ago. Um, and you can come up with um, some very rough estimates of the efficiency of the mineralizing process in these different, in these different catch main, catchment domains. And what you see essentially is that the, the ones with the steeper dip, so south flank, north flank, and to some extent, the Syncline Valley, they produce much, um, much higher grades, much more ore, and the efficiency of the ore forming process appears to be much greater than in these, these domains, the Highway Valley and our Deposit Valley, where the bedding dips are generally very much shallower. So to summarize, here's a little cartoon illustrating the, the model that we're proposing. Essentially rainfall, um, is, 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 in the in the in the, um, in the Eocene, Western Australia was was uh, much further south at that time. The climate was warmer. You were probably seeing um, temperate rainforest types ecosystems present in the Hamsley at that time. So the rainfall was leaching through significant thicknesses of, of organic matter at surface, picking up um, organic acids, which lowered the pH uh, the pH of that runoff. This modified meteoric water, slightly acidified, was then able to leach iron in the Vado zone, that's shown in blue here. Um, this is the, the original banded iron formation. After some of the iron had been leached out of it, it, it left behind this residual silicious and, and friable material, this, this leached biff, which we do occasionally find preserved at surface still. So this iron-rich, slightly acidified um, ore fluid then hits the water table. Now the groundwaters currently are slightly alkaline and they probably were back in the, the Eocene as well. And it's probably this, this contrast in pH that, that triggers the ore forming process. Mineralization takes place in this, this area here, down dip in this, this area colored pink, and so it produces your, your martite girthite ore. So that he, the magnetite in the original biff is replaced by hematite pseudomorphically, so that gives us the martite component, and the gang phases, the chert, the iron silicate and the iron carbonate, they're replaced by girthite, producing these, these, these lovely um, ochreous girthitic laminations. 
As this mineralizing pr uh, process proceeds, of course, the, 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 the ore fluids, the, the, the relic ore fluids become less iron rich and more silicious. And along the, 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 the lower edge and the outflow portions of the system, basically um, you can't fully, the, the, the banded iron formation is not fully mineralized. You've got relic quartz preserved, and that results in this um, characteristic silicious zone at the outflow portion of the, of the uh, ore system. And then the, uh, the ore fluids essentially, or the, the depleted ore fluids, then mix with, with the groundwater and we can no longer trace their, their, uh, their path. So the, 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 in this system, there is both, both a, a mass and fluid flux. There's definitely um, iron added to the, to the system, as we can see that the iron silicates, carbonates and quartz have been replaced by girthite. Silica has been quantitatively removed, except from um, this outflow portion where mineralization hasn't gone to completion. The main source of iron, of course, is the banded iron formation. It's leaching of iron from BIF, this is the original BIF, in the Vado zone. So this probably requires, um, as is the case for most supergene systems, uplift and erosion to basically replenish that source region and ensure that we have a, an ore, ore system that, that, that is long lived and, and produces a, an economic volume of, of mineralization. There is also a secondary source of iron, and that is from the non-redox conversion of magnetite to hematite that the ore forming process um, is, is uh, to, um, that takes place during the ore forming process. And this releases iron two plus to the fluid phase. So that is a secondary source of, of, of iron in the system. Now I've concentrated on the, 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 the gross scale of the deposits and what that can tell us, both the morphology and the compositional variation, what that can tell us about the ore forming pr process. I'd now like to quickly look at the, what, what petro petrography can tell us, what's going on at the grain scale, because this is very important for us with our direct shipping ores. We need to understand the ore textures because these relate, these influence the hardness of the rock and ultimately de determine the, the lump fine ratios and the way in which the, the ores will handle when they're processed through the ore handling plants. Petrography basically tells us that MG ore formation in the supergene systems is a three-stage process. So the first stage is pseudomorphic replacement, and this is where the stage at which the magnetite is pseudomorphed by hematite, giving martite, and the gang phases, the carbonates, silicates, and quartz are replaced by ochreous girthite, again, pseudomorphically. Stage two involves leaching and the removal of any remaining gang. This is largely quartz because it's the, the least readily pseudomorphed by, by girthite. And then there's a, final, a second stage of girthite uh, formation during stage three. This is a stage where there's infill and cementation of the, the porosity that's introduced during stage two. And the, um, the type of girthite is, 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 is petrographically quite, quite different. This type of girthite is, it appears to be brown girthite, whereas the pseudomorphic type appears to be ochreous girthite. And this is also significant. And then, of course, there's the overprinting effects of lateral weathering, and this produces further cementing um, of the rock, basically by the fine intercalating bands of coliform vitreous girthite and hydrohematite that form, um, that line the void spaces within the weathering profile. The photomicrograph on the, on the right here just shows a, a boundary between, this is stage, um, Stage one girthite, it's basically a stage two, so there's a lot of porosity. That's what this dark gray material is. On the right here, the brighter gray, this is the, the, the brown girthite of stage three. This, this girthite is coming in and cementing the pore space, producing, uh, greatly reducing the porosity um, in the bottom half of this photomicrograph. I'll just quickly go through these stages uh, in a little bit more detail. So the stage one, which is the replacement stage, uh, and this is a, a hand best or some drill core basically showing the, the original, um, the initiation of the, the, the stage one replacement where there's still relic silica around. And in the photomicrographs, you can see beautiful girthite pseudomorphs, the dark gray material is girthite, the brighter white material is, is martite or hematite pseudomorphic magnetite. But you can see beautiful girthite pseudomorphs after rhombic carbonate grains in the original rock and after fibrous silicate grains. 
in this photomicrograph in the center here. Again, beautiful sheaves of what were originally probably um, Minnesotite sheaves um, have been, they've been girthitized, but the, the shape of those original acicular silicate crystals is beautifully preserved. And on the, on the right here, you can see a case where there is girthite that's starting to replace quartz grains. The dark material here is quartz. Um, the girthite grains are starting to replace the quartz around grain boundaries, giving a sort of reticulated uh, texture. You can see a nice pseudomorph of a uh, carbonate rhomb here, again, in, in girthite. And this white material here is, is, is all martite. So this is the, the stage one, and this type of girthite is incredibly fine grained. It's ochreous. Um, it probably has a lot of nanoporosity uh, associated with that replacement. Stage two, this is the stage at which any remaining gang is, is, is dissolved out. This is the photomicrograph I just showed you and with the dark material here being quartz. Compare that with the texture in this central photomicrograph with this is a stage two ore. The dark material here is actually pore space, but you can still see, um, I think that sort of reticulated texture where the girthite has been um, forming along the original church grain boundaries. I'll also draw your attention to the contrast in the, in the martite. This is the martite in the original um, uh, stage one ore. It's quite, it's quite dense, it's quite solid, uh, but at stage two, it too is leached. So you can see this, this trellis textured um, remnants of, uh, of the martite. And this is what the, this material looks like in hand specimen. It's incredibly friable. I mean, I can pick that up with my hand and crush it quite easily. And you'll notice the, the, the bright mustardy yellow of the ochreous girthite and the, the dark gray of the martyr grains. Stage three, this is the, uh, the stage at which um, that, that further generation of girthite comes in and infills pore space. Here's a hand specimen. You can see a little bit of Girth, ochreous girthite on this parting here, but the main, the main, um, the majority of the this this sedimentary band here has been cemented with brown girthite, and it's very very hard. In photomicrograph on the bottom left here, the dark grey material is the earlier generation of ochreous girthite. It's extremely fine grained, and hence its reflection, its reflective um, character is, is, is it produces these dark grey colours. You can see a, a skeletal um, rhomb here from an original carbonate grain, and overgrowing that skeletal frame are, are these, these um, orthogonally uh, nucleating grains of brown girthite with a slightly brighter reflectance. So this is the, the girthite, girthite that is coming in during stage three and starting to fill in the pore space. The photomicrograph here in the center, you can see that illustrated quite, quite beautifully. So the top left here, Essentially, what you're looking at are the original martite um, after magnetite laminae. In the primary BIF, what, what is now void space here would originally have been quartz with a bit of carbonate in it, but it's, it's been um, dissolved out during stage two. And here we have the stage three fluids coming, obviously accessing along bedding planes from the bottom right here, depositing, depositing brown girthite um, along the walls of these, these or along the bedding planes, basically. The crystals are growing orthogonally into that void space and are starting to progressively fill in the, the original, what were original, originally the chert bands in this, this, this band of iron formation. And the photomicrograph on the right here, you can see the um, infill of what was originally a quartz band um, dissolved out during stage two is now almost completely infilled by the stage three girthite. And the highly, highly skeletal textured martites um, from stage two, they too have been infilled with, with, with a, the second phase of girthite. So the effect of this stage three event is, is to, to, to basically harden up the rock again. Um, it infills the pore space and uh, creates a much harder, harder rock. And finally, the effects of laterotic weathering, there's your, your hand specimen, um, you can't really see any, any evidence of the original sedimentary banding. Under the, the photo, under, the, under the microscope, you can see that the pores space, the pores are basically lined with, with multiple layers of uh, coliform and botryoidal girthite. In other places, the, 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 you've got girthite and hydrohematite um, alternating, again, lining the void space. 
um, and cementing the rock even further. And in some places, the, the, these coliform intergrowths completely, actually completely fill the void space, as you can see here. So again, the effects, the effects of weathering also are, are to increase the hardness of, of your, your ore. And that's why we get the best, we, we observe empirically that our best lump ratios, our highest lump um, products come from the, the near surface material within about the top 50 meters. And this is a result of this coliform um, banding that essentially cements the rock even further during the weathering process. Now, how are these all stages distributed in 3D? This is a little um, schematic cross section with your banded iron formation dipping 45 degrees. Um, here's the, the paleo land surface and the paleo water table, um, and you're getting meteoric recharge from surface here. Essentially what we find, and this is a simplification, but, but basically what, what we find is the stage one mineralization, that's where you have relic quartz still preserved. That, that, that material occurs at the down dip and the basal portion of your, your ore, ore body. Just up dip from that, that's where you tend to find those very, very friable, very porous rocks of stage two. They've been highly leached um, and they consist of ochreous goethite and martite. Uh, and then up to that, that again are the rocks that have, have been re-cemented during stage three. So in these rocks, you've got brown goethite coming in, infilling the pore space and, and, and making the rock hard again. So why have I labored the, the petrography? Um, it's really because our ores are direct shipping and it's really, really, really important that we understand how they behave, not only chemically, but physically as well. And key to the physical behavior is basically the mineralogy and the texture of our ores. And this in turn is controlled by ore genesis. There've been some studies, um, there's a comprehensive study by Manuel and Clout that basically is also telling us that the, the different types of goethite, the ochreous, which tends to come in during stage one, the brown goethite that kept, comes in during stage three, and the vitreous goethite that's associated with the weathering profile, these different types of goethite tend to have quite different compositions. The other thing we have to bear in mind um, with our chemical composition is not just the, all, the iron grade of, of what we're shipping, we also have to take into account what are known as deleterious elements. And these are things like aluminium, silica, and phosphorus. So we also may need to monitor to make sure that the levels of those elements are not too high because they're all phases, that are, they're all elements that are deleterious in the steel making process. What the study of, of Manuel and Clouds showed is that the ochreous goethite can have an extraordinarily high nanoporosity, um, up to 70%. This is important because um, if we have a, although we try and dewater our mines well ahead of, uh, of production, the Hammersley province sits in a zone that's, that's, that's prone to cyclonic weather events during the summer months. And if we have a rainfall event, a, great, a big cyclone coming through, for example, everything gets wet and material that's very rich in this ochreous goethite with its high nanoporosity, it's porous, but it's not permeable. And it takes, a, it, it takes a long time for that material to drain. And when it's wet, it's extraordinarily sticky and claggy, and it can cause real problems in your handling plant because it gums everything up. Um, the brown goethite, this is really the thing we want to mine because it's got the highest iron and the lowest um, deleterious element contents. The vitreous goethite, this, is, this also has fairly high alum, aluminium and silica contents in it, and it tends to have the lowest iron of, of all the goethite types. So this is why it's important to understand ore genesis. The, the ore texture controls the hardness of, of the rock, and this has really important implications for us for materials handling, where we are a bulk mining operation, we, need, um, we basically need everything to be flowing through the system um, in order to maximize our production. Um, and that's, uh, it's, therefore it's really, really important that we understand how we're going to handle and that we don't, for example, tip two trucks of, of um, claggy ore into an ore crusher in succession because we'll basically end up blocking the, the crusher and losing production as a result. So just a quick summary um, of the ore forming, um, the ore genesis model here. So back in the mid-Eocene when these deposits formed, there, this is the, the banded iron formation, 
for example, south flank dipping nicely to the south. There, were, there are some Cretaceous sediments sitting in that, that valley fill position, but essentially what you had was water picking up, um, picking, picking up humic acid, uh, leaching iron in the Vado zone, and then going on that, traveling on along, along bedding planes to mineralize the banded iron formation beneath the water table, producing high grade ore after the original banded iron formation and more aluminous ores after the, the, the shaley West Angela material. material. Down dip of both these, these ore zones, you can see a chemical modification that tells you the, the path of the ore fluid. In the case of the West Angel system, you're getting these manganiferous shales um, passing outwards into fresh carbonate rich West Angeles. And down dip of the high grade ores, you get this silicious zone where the mineralization hasn't gone to completion. Contrast that, fast forward to the mid Miocene, um, and this is um, onwards. This is the, the time at which um, the, the, the major lateralic weathering event took place. Uh, there was a second generation of sediments that had been deposited by, the, by this, this stage, um, Cenozoic sediments. And essentially, and there's been erosion, of course, uh, in the interim, and the water table has been lowered during that, that time. And essentially what you see now is that the, 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 lateral, the effects of lateral weathering overprinting the original um, primary zonation of the, of the fresh mineralization. So to conclude, I hope I've illustrated um, the, the, the mass flux fluid flow model that we're proposing for supergene MGOs. And I hope I've also illustrated why it's so important in this mining business to understand all genesis, because it has such important impacts on not only the way in which our, our, our product um, behaves, but also in our lump fine ratio, which is, is, is also very important, and the deleterious component uh, um, distribution, both of which both of which are really important to our customers. I want to end by posing a final question. Why is it that the Hammersley province is so well endowed with, with supergene MG ores? These are, these, this is a style of mineralization that's rarely found in economic co concentrations outside of the Hammersley province. So why, why is this? And we believe it's actually based on, on the coincidence in space and time of three factors. The first of which is having um, an abundant um, source of iron in the form of an iron-rich protolith. And the Hamsey province is probably the largest outcropping area of, of Bith in the world. This plan view on the right here shows the, the extent of the Hamsey province and the outcrop in blue of the Brockman iron formation and in yellow of the Marin Amber iron formation. So there's a vast, vast area of outcrop of iron-rich protolith in this particular area. The second critical factor is, is regional scale uplift. Remember, these are, these are supergene um, systems. So it's important that there's ongoing uplift during mineralization to basically replenish the source region, which is that near surface zone with, with more iron rich material. And what we notice is that even though we're sitting on the southern flank of a, a very ancient Archean craton, the highest mountain in WA is actually situated, sorry, situated about here, it's Mount Meharry, just to the northwest of mining area C and South Line. And if you look at the modern topography, the, this is just a topographic map with the contours colored, hot colors being high and blue colors being low, there's the coastline. What you can see is that there's a very discrete domal um, shaped zone of, of topographic highs that are related in space almost completely associated with the Hammersley province or the outcrop of the Hammersley group um, of rocks. And there's been some work done on this. There's a great paper by Carol Sonota that basically attributes this, this uh, uplift. He can trace it back to, to about starting at about 60 million years ago. Um, and he attributes this to dynamic, dynamic topography to basically um, thermal effects in the mantle. And finally, the third factor that, that must, that, that's been very, very important, um, at 45 million years ago, Australia was located much further south than it is today, at about 50 degrees south. And at the that time, of course, the, um, it's the time of the Eocene climatic optimum, the global climate was much warmer. We have palynological evidence that there were temperate rainforest species present in this area in the, in the Eocene. So we think that the climate was, was warm and at least seasonally wet at, 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 in the Eocene. So essentially we've got the coincidence of these three critical factors, an iron-rich protolith, um, ongoing uplift, and a warm and seasonally wet climate. 
And these factors coincided both in space and in time for the Hammersley province. And there, that's what has, has resulted in such spectacular iron endowment. This lovely photograph of the, uh, uh, on the right here is a view across the Fortescue Valley from Marilana. And what you can see here in these cliffs here, these are um, cliffs of Brockman iron formation that's been mineralized with supergene mineralization. Lovely, deep red, high grade iron ore. And I just want to leave you with this view here of the, the Western highlands of Tasmania with um, Southern Beach, this temperate rainforest species on the, on the, on the closing the hillsides and these boggy um, valley flats with button grass plains and, and, and myriad little, little lakes. And I want to leave you with this thought that perhaps this is what the Hammersley province looked like back in the Eocene. Thanks very much. Brilliant talk, Caroline, and great images and photographs throughout that uh, presentation and interesting model that you guys are proposing for the uh, mineralization in the whole system. Just a reminder, we are encouraged to use the Q&A session for the Q&A button for the questions. Please do place them in there and then I'll be sure to pass them on to Caroline. And please do bear with us. We will be finishing very soon. So we'll ask you to just um, stick around for the next 40 minutes and then we will say goodbye to everyone. So there is a question and I think you briefly spoke about that even the last slide, I think, on the origin of the beef protocol. Would you like to maybe just comment on that more? I think perhaps, yes, that was perhaps a misleading term for me to use. Um, I don't mean that the that the BIF has been somehow upgraded prior to the supergene event. I just mean that the BIF, it, the BIF itself is is the proto or um, yes, I apologize. That's perhaps perhaps confusing. Thank you. Um, it's clear. Either the talk was clear, or everyone's getting tired, or. I just don't have questions. <laughs> um, and then I promise this is the, the, hopefully the last reminder to renew your membership, SDG membership. And if you're not a member, please do sign up. I'm sure you're sick and tired of me mentioning that, but I have to um, keep mentioning. Any more questions for Caroline? like we do not have any questions for you Caroline I'd like to thank you again for an interesting talk um, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you we'll be sending out invites from us in chapter oh well not so fast there is a question in the chat sorry <laughs> this came in now um, question says thanks Caroline for the wonderful presentation can maritime formation after magnetite and hydrogen be expected also in porphyry copper hydrothermal alterations Example in pelvic alteration. Should I repeat oh, the question? Gosh, um, I don't really know. I don't know much about um, porphyry copper sy um, systems, but this type of this type of martite martite generation typically forms in a laterally weathery well snow. That's not true. In a in a in an environment where you've got warm, wet fluids, so I guess it would depend on with a porphyry system what type of climatic um, history that 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 body has had um, at a time when the porphyry itself was eroded to the state to to, to the extent that it was near surface. Um, remember, all these these ores form. From the surface downwards, so um, I'm not sure whether they would form in a hypergene setting within a porphyry cop copper system. Um, you possibly could get martyrization if that porphyry was then eroded and, and um, went through a, an episode of, of uplift in a, in a at a time when the, the local climate was was warm and wet. Um, then similar sort of fluids could affect the, the type of, of martyrization that we're seeing in the supergene system in our formations. Thank you. All right. Um, it does not look like we have more questions for you, Caroline. So thank you again for the brilliant talk. My pleasure. Thank you very much. All right. 
once again, um, a huge thank you to our lectures uh, for the wonderful talks and insights. And it was a pleasure to host you all. Now to wrap up this session, um, I'm excited to um, ask or request the SDG president like Stuart Simmons to wrap up the session for us and say some words before we can um, say good night or bye to everyone. Stuart, I hand over the floor to you. Okay. All right, ready? Um, look, uh, first, uh, thanks to everyone on the program today. Uh, it's uh, lived up to the high standard uh, anticipated by Hallelujah at the start. And thanks, Hallelujah, for hosting us. It's been uh, wonderful having you. And of course, uh, a, a really uh, important thanks to all the speakers for their, for their talks. This program really celebrates the heart and soul of the Society of Economic Geologists, which is the geoscience of ore deposits. The talks were presented in eloquent fashion and covered a spectrum of cap captivating uh, subjects. And it's also great to see a really uh, good turnout of interested listeners from around the world. I've been asked to speak in my capacity as the incoming president uh, and to touch on the focus of efforts for 2023, but I'm gonna keep this uh, really brief. As, as has been mentioned, um, an important transition is underway with the announcement last July that Brian Hall is stepping down after 22 years of steady leadership uh, as executive director. Uh, the search for Brian's successor has really dominated some of the behind the scenes activities over the last few months. And although not finalized, the new director is expected to take up the position in a few months time. And I'm hopeful that the transition is gonna be smooth and seamless. Uh, but one might practically expect that there'll be a few bumps along the way. Thus much of the first half of next year is really going to be focused and dedicated to ensuring that these have minimum impact on the planned program of activities. And these include the preparations for the 2023 meeting in London. There's an exciting program planned as Chico mentioned uh, and everyone should be looking forward to being there. I certainly am. Also on the agenda, and uh, this is also important, is a strategic planning exercise that was started earlier this year, but then was suspended uh, when Brian's uh, retirement was announced. Uh, the outcomes of this will be really important, particularly in planning of directions and priorities for the new executive director. And then probably the last thing I just wanna touch on is that I'm really mindful of the external pressures on our publishing activities and the need to formulate a lasting strategy that protects the quality of the science we value in the publications that we produce. I need to mention that the ongoing activities of SCG Foundation, the support for the students, early career professionals, and of course, across the, the range of society will continue with vigor. So don't expect any real changes there. And, and just in closing, and on behalf of the SCG, first, echo what Chico said and extend the deep thanks to Maura Smith for her, her role as she completes her three-year term as president. And then also extend a warm welcome to Steve Piercy who comes in as president-elect. And, and for me, I'm just grateful that Chico's still around to have his support and wise counsel going forward into the next year um, as we deal with this smooth transition uh, to welcoming in a new executive director. So thanks, everyone. I hope everyone has a, uh, a, a good holiday season and best wishes for 2023. And we'll be back and seeing you again in the not too distant future. And you'll be hearing from me. Thanks. Mm -hmm.